to have cell phones in the off mode or in the airplane position or airplane mode, please. The cellular data signals do interfere with our wireless microphones. So uh, just as a reminder, please put your cell phones in the off mode or in airplane mode. We would certainly appreciate that. Once again, we'll be starting our presentations in here in about 20 minutes, less just under 20 minutes. So make sure you do grab some food and refreshments. Uh, claim a seat. I'm sure that a lot of you would want to grab the seats uh, up toward the front. So once again, we want to welcome you here to Edmodo. We're certainly glad to host the Global Leadership Summit this afternoon. Uh, if you have any questions, if you need to connect to the Wi-Fi, you can come see myself here. My name is Allison over here at the tech table. Thank you.
All right. Again, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Edmodo. Time is now 3.56. We have just under 15 minutes until we begin our presentations. So if you want to go ahead and start finding your way toward a seat, uh, you'd probably want to go ahead and start doing that. Make sure you do grab some refreshments along the way. Uh, do grab your name tag if you haven't done so already up here at the front table. Uh, we want to make sure that we know who you are. Once again, also, please make sure that your cell phones are in the off mode or in airplane mode. If you do need to get your emails for whatever reason, you can connect to our guest Wi-Fi. To be able to do that, grab one of the little guest Wi-Fi cards up here at the tech table. Once again, we want to welcome you here to Edmodo. We just have under 15 minutes until our presentations begin. Once again, this is your 15-minute warning. Come on in and grab a seat. Start making your way towards your seats. We'll begin in 15 minutes. All right, good afternoon, folks. We have about 10 minutes until our presentations begin. Please make your way toward the seats. Go ahead and grab your seats now. Grab some refreshments on the way. We have 10 minutes, so please go ahead and make your way toward the seats. Thank you.
All right, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, from your cockpit. This is your captain speaking. We have about five minutes until an on-time departure, so please go ahead and grab your seats. And we, begin, we can begin our presentation here very shortly. Just a couple of quick housekeeping announcements. Obviously, we have refreshments up here at the front table. You can certainly grab those at any time during the presentation and bring them to your seat. The restrooms are located in the main office area, so please proceed around by the refrigerators and then down the hallway about halfway down the building to your left and you will find the lavatories. Once again, all phones must be in the off position or in airplane mode during our flight today. The wireless signals do interfere with our equipment, i.e. our wireless microphones. So please make sure that you do turn your phones off or put them in the airplane mode. If you do want to connect to wireless, you can have your phone in airplane mode and connect to the guest Wi-Fi network here at Edmodo. If you need that information, we do have the Wi-Fi cards up here at the front desk. So you can cer certainly grab those as well. All right, sit back, relax. We'll begin our presentation here in just another five more minutes. We certainly enjoy having you here at Edmodo. We know you have many choices of, of venues that you can choose. And we certainly are glad that you chose Edmodo this afternoon. <laughs> there. I'm oh, sorry. All right, good afternoon, folks. We have just another minute until we begin our presentations here. Once again, we want to welcome you here to Edmodo, and we're certainly happy to host the Global Leadership uh, Week and the Global Leadership Summit today. Uh, just, again, a couple of reminders. Please put your phones in the off position or in the airplane mode. If you do need to connect to Wi-Fi, you can certainly grab one of our Wi-Fi cards up here at the tech table. So without further ado, I'll go ahead and turn over the microphone to your host to start out. Steve, uh, take it away. The microphone is yours. Is it on? 
takes a second to come on. It's not yet. It's uh, the a light is on. Are you hearing me? I mean, I know you can hear me, but are you hearing me through the microphone? I don't think so. Not yet. Are we closer? Yeah, you can hear me. Welcome. Thanks for coming. This is the Global Leadership Summit. Whoa. Yes. <laughs> okay, so I'm Steve Hargadon, and this is Lucy Gray. We're co-chairs of the Global Education Conference, which has now morphed into four events a year. We're really happy that you're here, uh, and we're really appreciative. I want to express thanks to Ed Moto for hosting today. If you're from Ed Moto, will you raise your hand? Thank you so much. Okay, so um, we also want to introduce our leadership team. So if you're on our leadership team, will you stand? So Adina. Adina. So uh, Cleary Von Lee from Global Oneness, and uh, Dana Mortensen from World Savvy, and uh, Brandon Wiley from Global Ed Leader, and Adina Popa, whose title is way too long, so we're just gonna say from Loudoun County. Good. And, oh, and Mark Potter from VIF. We got Dana, Cleary, Brandon. Julie Lindsay's not here, but she's been a part of our team. And Adina. Good. Okay, so um, we also want to thank our sponsors. So if you're here from a sponsoring organization, would you stand? That would include VIF, the Wonderment. Jamie, you can stand for Google. Iron. Iron. Oh, there you are. Jennifer. Okay, so uh, yes, th this is actually a really impressive list. And we're now what six years, right? And and we let we need to give a real shout out to Iron, who who supported the conference from the, the from the very beginning. And it's really nice to see other names on this list, and we really appreciate it. Yes, thank you. Okay, so uh, we thought we would take a minute and describe the Global Education Conference because it's surprising that, e that even within this audience there may be people who don't know what that event is. Do you want to tell the story? They, we tell the story slightly differently. So if Lucy gets to tell the story. It's long-winded, so I better be really quick about this. Um, I started in a, an online space uh, using the platform Ning a number of years ago, inspired by Steve because he started classroom2.0.com in the Ning platform and had, I remember, like 13,000 people the first month. And I was like, whoa, this is pretty cool. So this is like back in 2006, 2007. And uh, so I started in Ning, and Steve came to me a couple years later and said, what can we do with your community, my community, and um, Blackboard Collaborate to impact education? I'm like, really? We're going to impact education? Um, I still am a little wondering about that, but well, we're, we're getting there. Uh, and so we started doing this online conference in that's completely virtual, 24 hours around the clock, five days a week. We're kind of paring it down to about three right now. Um, and it's been a really extraordinary experience with, um, particularly because we've gotten to know people all over the world. We've had regular people volunteer to moderate sessions. Uh, we've gotten to know our presenters and keynotes who've generously volunteered their time from year to year. Esther has been one of our keynotes several times. Jamie's keynoted, we've had several other people bring on this keynoted, um, and it's really been an, an, a wonderful journey. But we also feel that face-to-face -face events are not going away, and that it's important for us to meet up periodically and for everybody in this space to kind of get to know each other. So we've been doing a meetup at ISTE every year for the past four years where we have uh, two to 300 educators who come together for a very interactive uh, three-hour meetup, and now we're kind of expanding into the leadership space by hosting this event. Um, anything else you want to add to that? No, that's a nice summary, your version of the story. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, the one piece I remember that's not in there is that we were at a COSIN event, a Global Education Day, and we saw all these symposium. people, symposium, and we saw all these people come up to speak and we're like, we know that person, we know that person, we know that person. We thought, we should do this online. I, you don't remember that. I remember you coming up to me at SLA and asking me about it. Good, well, I'm glad we have different versions. Okay, so well, one of the things that I think we feel privileged to have been a part of is this shift toward peer-to-peer -to -peer, uh, professional development. And so Classroom 2.0, Edmodo, I mean this whole sort of movement toward 
uh, people connecting with each other, and I think that's what the Global Education Conference does so brilliantly, right, is it allows teachers to present to each other, and for many of them, it's their first time presenting. So if you're a teacher in Nepal on a, on a cell, cellular modem, you may only have three people come into your room, but those three, that's a significant event for you to actually have presented from some, from some remote part of the world to other people. So I, I think that uh, we feel really privileged to have been a part of this sort of larger dramatic shift in how we teach each other. It's also about empowerment. It is about empowerment. It's about uh, becoming sort of a proactive agent. And, and ultimately, w what we hope is that that, so that moment for the teacher where they feel like they've actually created and then presented gives them a better understanding of the world for their students, where students have become creators. Good. Okay, so we have some real fun today. We have three panel discussions. We're going to keep them um, time with good time boundaries so that you know exactly what's happening and you don't feel like it goes on too long, but they're going to be good. We're going to start by showing a film from The Wonderment, a couple of minutes, and then Amy, will you come up and tell us about that? Do you want to talk first or do you want to talk after? I want to talk after. I want to talk about the kids' talking. Okay. <laughs> okay, so Allison, can we cue that up? the same playing field. There aren't people that are have their PhDs and some kids that don't know how to read or know how to speak and so it's kind of global learning is making sure everyone has the same access to adopt that information into them. I've never heard that word before, like I've never heard that. Can I have a little time to yeah. oh. <sighs> I don't know. But I feel like it's global so like the whole world learning. I feel like we are always trying to learn something new so I feel like it's going to be like learning from each other. If I learn and don't accept it then that's my choice but I have the opportunity. When I heard global, like, it's, I mean it's really new and global means like being with another, being with other friends from another country that just, that just makes me excited and yeah. <laughs> First of all, Makes me nervous too. I think it means that you can learn about different cultures, about the environment, and I mean it's just different all over the world. You learn about different things in the world, like culture, of course, the people, the um, well. Talk about culture is big, and culture is I think probably mostly everything about global uh, global learning. Culture can include as food, like every little things that different from different countries, or like their dances, their tradition, their people, their, uh, and their clothes, everything that different from every country. It doesn't just mean Can I have a little time to kiss him? Yeah. Oh. <sighs> I don't know. But I feel like it's global, so like the whole world learning. I feel like we are always trying to learn something new. So I feel like it's going to be like learning from each other. If I learn and don't accept it, then that's my choice, but I have the opportunity. When I heard global, like, it's, I mean, it's really new. And Global means like being with another, being with other friends from another country. That just that just makes me excited and yeah. First of all, makes me nervous too. I think it means that you can learn about different cultures, about the environment, and I mean it's just different all over the world. You learn about different things in the world, like culture, of course, the people. The, um, well, talk about culture is big, and culture is, I think, probably mostly everything about global uh, global learning. Culture can include as 
food, like every little thing that different from different countries, or like their dances, their tradition, their people, their uh, and their clothes, everything that different from every countries. It doesn't just mean study some subject or something like that. How to make a friends can be learning and something like how to communicate with people that can be learning. Being willing to like talk to people about it. Like if someone's from a different culture, be like able to talk to them so you can learn from them. You experience different opinions and attitudes of people about certain things and like have other food. But then there are also a lot of people, they just don't open themselves up to learn. And so there's one of my uh, teachers in Vietnam, he come and teach, teach us English. And he and in the beginning, he, he showed us a song in Vietnamese. Would like some, uh, some guy sing it in Vietnamese. And we were like, who's that guy? And he's like, yes. We were like, right, is that you? And he's like, yeah. And he can speak Vietnamese fluently. I was like, wow, how, how can you do that? You have to open it, you have to be like it to, to do it. Or if you don't like it, enjoy it, and maybe you can find something that you like it so you can learn it. So I think everything in my life can be learning, I think. So just not just how to study, how to solve the problem. So just experience is learning, I think. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> so I'll be super fast since we got that already. But um, one of the main reasons that we've been asking kids around the world these questions, um, I, we're a nonprofit organization um, who started out with the question, how do you have, help kids have a sense of belonging in the world? And um, what, what influence does that sense of belonging have on everything else that they do, on learning, on, on participating in their communities? Um, and how do kids, if they don't feel that sense of belonging to themselves or to the community around them, how can they then extend that to a global setting? Um, and so it's been, I'm sure as, any, as everyone here knows, it's a very complex process. <laughs> it's something that takes into account like the most vulnerable and exciting parts of what make us human. And um, as we have gotten more into that process, we've noticed how important it is for us to constantly be asking kids first and to really be understanding what they are seeing these, the, you know, it's, it's really easy to get going on something and not necessarily being aware of how they're processing it or how they're internalizing it. Um, and so as we built the wonderment, and um, and the wonderment really is, it's it's a, we call it an ecosystem, but we realize that's a terrible uh, cliched phrase at times, but it is, it's, it's, it's a platform, but then it's also community engagement pieces that d interact directly with kids and, and build systems so that they can lead that process themselves. Um, and we've just felt like it, the closest thing that we've found um, that that mimics is the kind of the dance of creativity. And that when we are being creative with each other, um, there's something about it that um, really is uh, how we kind of become these global creators that, um, that Steve was talking about. Um, so we feel incredibly privileged, A, to be here with you, but then also to be interacting with these kids on a daily basis. We've, it's pretty, it's pretty incredible when kids really do see themselves as those creators. I'll mention one thing. We, Global Education Day, we actually talked about the bus that we did uh, with some kids in Guatemala had an idea to serve the kids in the rural part of their neighborhoods that didn't have access to school or libraries. They brought the idea to us. That we made a bus, basically, that went around to these um, rural neighborhoods. And these kids, because they were involved in the process of actually initiating that idea, bringing it, and, cre and creating it with us, um, we, they are now teaching hundreds of kids every week and changing attitudes about literacy in their city and in their country. And there's a group, a, a group of five high school students that um, that are doing this, and so we just we've really seen that power. So that's why we made that little film. Is we just we think that when we ask kids, that's the that's the place for all these processes to start. So thank you for letting us be here. Oh, thank you. Okay, so before our first panel comes up, we're going to give you a question assignment, which is to think about your personally most transformative global experience. Your personally most transformative global experience. 
and turn to your neighbor and talk about that while we invite the first panel up. Okay, so that's <laughs> Betsy, Jamie, Amy, <laughs> Esther, yeah, they're, I think they know. Timer there will start, and that's your timer. See the big 30. Okay, you can keep having this conversation during the breaks, but we're going to start with the first panel now. The buzz got. Elevated, so you must have had some transformative experiences. Good afternoon. My name is Betsy Corcoran, and I'm CEO and co-founder of EdSurge, and I'm delighted to be here today. Uh, I want to give a special shout out, really, uh, to Steve and Lucy, for whom global education has been a vision, a passion, a commitment for so many years. Please, let's give it up for Steve and Lucy. So we have a terrific panel of people who've had experience in education all over the world. And um, I, I, um, I we're going to talk about the good, we're going to talk about how to make it better, and we're going to talk about where it could go wrong, too, because without recognition of the challenges that sometimes come up, we have problems. We will save a couple of minutes right at the end for questions. And so if you have a question, I know Lucy has one, uh, hang on to those questions and we'll get to them. We'll take a couple minutes at the end. Uh, so first, um, I'm going to kind of introduce our folks one by one. And I asked them to tell us, share with us, one idea, one, one example of how they've seen technology really supporting global education in the last couple of months that would not have been possible five years ago. And we're going to start with Vibhu Matal of Edmodo. So I, you know, to some extent, uh, there are a number of examples, th examples that I would cite, but the one that uh, moved me the most when I first read about it was the fact that we now have a world champion in javelin thrower, a Kenyan, who learned the art of javelin throwing by looking at YouTube. <laughs> and that's pretty amazing when you think of it because athletics is not necessarily a sport that you learn by watching. There's also an example of a 10-year-old kid in Indonesia who's like one of the world's greatest pianists who's learned entirely by watching YouTube. If you think of how much technology can change education, we're not just talking of people achieving standard level classroom competence. I'm talking of people who are the best in the world at what they do. And that, if you can do it by just watching YouTube videos, think of how much we could do better by having a coordinated set of resources that people could use. Fantastic. Amy Lynn is with TES Global, Amy, and has been an entrepreneur herself. Amy, what, what are you seeing going on? Yeah, I think one of my favorite demonstrations of the intersection of kind of where we are with education technology is being able to empower students to really be the creators and the leaders in their learning. Um, and I think one of my favorite examples around, you know, students kind of doing reports about different cultures, either in their foreign language classes or in their history classes, but not just isolating that to their classroom experiences, but being able to actually connect virtually with students of that culture in an online learning environment and being able to learn firsthand, you know, what is French food actually like? And then in return for American students, being able to demonstrate what American food is really like and that not being just an isolated experience inside the classroom, but having kind of two classrooms on either side of the globe, being really able to connect virtually through the aid of technology. And do that through Skype, through Periscope, through all of the different media that we now have? There's so many, whether they're ed tech specific or whether they are actually just social networks that are being leveraged for educational purposes. 
Great. Esther Wojcicki is a very famous educator. She is also a journalist close to my own heart and has written a fantastic book called Moonshots and Blended Learning. Esther, you've been all over the world and have seen a lot. What's your favorite example? Well, I think number one with my students, they now, everybody has some kind of a device. Everybody. And a lot of them have Chromebooks, actually. And so you can connect. Yes, I hope you like that, Jamie. That, that was a plug <laughs> for Google <laughs> there. <laughs> connect to kids in all different parts of the world. So my students are actually making videos now where they are going to be sharing them with kids in other parts of the world. They just came up with this idea themselves, bef you know, because we're kind of newspaper, magazine, radio, television. But they decided they had to have a video on their website to connect with other kids in other parts of the world. So are they just putting this up there, or are they going to specifically reach out to particular groups of students? Uh, I th at this point, I think they're just putting it up there, but then they also want to reach out to particular groups of students. And um, so, you know, I'm traveling, as you mentioned, around the world quite a bit. So I've met quite a few groups, and so I have some target groups in mind to help them get established. But, um, you know, I use their phones. You know how a lot of school districts, they ban the phone? <laughs> well, I use their phones. Mm -hmm. So every kid can always find whatever it is I'm talking about, like instantaneously, in case you haven't noticed. They know how to find it. Uh, Jamie Cassip is from Google. He is Google's chief evangelist and has probably done more than almost anyone else that I know to support uh, people of color using technology and education and to really hammer this message that this is, has got to be an inclusive world. Jamie, talk a little bit about what you've seen on the positive side, and we'll get to cautionary examples in a minute. Yeah, thank you. That's the nicest thing Betsy's ever said about me. <laughs> 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 I'm, Betsy and I go back a long way. I, I, anytime she's near a microphone, I, I have panic attacks. Uh, <laughs> when we're in the same space. <laughs> anyway, so um, I think the coolest thing that I've seen in, in the last five years is actual virtual reality. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that uh, is that it we're brand new. We're on day one of what virtual reality can do. But I had this experience where um, I got to see some video that Global Nomads put together around Syria. And as someone who is half, s I'm half Syrian. A lot of people don't know this, but I'm half Argentine, half Syrian. So I'm late to everything. But the... <laughs> But I, um, you know, you can see a picture. You can, you know, you can see a picture of Syria. You can watch a video of Syria. But when you are in Syria, when you put those glasses on, and it doesn't matter if it's cardboard or what the all the other ones that are out there. But that uh, that immersion that happens when you're inside a space and that empathy that you can get by actually experiencing and seeing what that's like. I think we're at like step one of the possibility of what virtual reality can do. So I'd say in the last five years, that seems. The, the, the technology that's in my head the most in terms of what we can do to make people feel like they're in certain places and to have certain experiences. Okay, so, so Jamie tempted me by saying that was the nicest I ever was to him. So <laughs> yeah, now, now comes... Now I'm in trouble. Now you're in trouble. Now comes the mean side. So who controls the story, though? Probably more so then even in the United States, once this technology is in the world, Amy, you started talking about students starting to tell their story. Jamie, I'm going to push back at you uh, and say that virtual reality takes a lot of money to make. And so who's telling the story? And do you see technology supporting authentic voices and helping people share their authentic culture? Or does it risk letting someone else tell the story? Yeah, I'll start. I mean, this is nothing new, right? History is told by those who won, right? So the, <laughs> the, the, that is definitely something you have to watch out for is that you can actually, who controls the content, who, who gets to build that. But I can also, in my pocket right now, can create my own very cheap virtual reality experience, right? Where I can film something and then put it in my cardboard and watch it. So um, I would say, I'm not pushing back, but I would say that it's both. I think users, uh, might be able to, to build those stories because they'll have that technology in their pockets to be able to create those experiences. So not only can you go and tell somebody what's happening in Syria, not only can you not write about it, you can, like the New York Times is doing, I can post video as a, as a user that uh, someone can dive into and immerse themselves into the world that I'm trying to show them 
through that virtual reality, and I think users have that that power. Ibn? So I think, I mean, I agree with uh, Jamie that uh, there are a number of uh, points that one can take in this, and I would only just go so far as to add to the fact that if you have millions of people participating in this platform, it's hard to sometimes try and control where the story is going to come from. And I think you've seen examples of this in a lot of social media, and I say this partly because Edmodo is a social medium for education, so I'm giving it a plug. But I think in some ways, uh, you really, I think one of the big powers of having a lot of people participate in any conversation is that you, it's very hard to have a single point of view and you will see a lot of different threads come about. Esther, do you hear authentic stories? Do you worry about the stories that, that the technology is supporting people telling? Well, my goal is to empower my students so they tell the authentic story from their perspective. And so I'm a number one proponent here of the First Amendment rights for students. So uh, we have nine publications, and it gives the students an opportunity to create story, write anything they want. We have newspapers, magazine, television, radio, pretty much anything in the media is what I give them an opportunity. So, and I think it's super important to give students that right to speak out. Amy? At the end of the day, I think oftentimes, myself included as technologists, we often forget that technology is simply a tool. You know, it's not the end all be all, it's not the solution, and it's all about how you use it. And I think this is where, you know, teachers and students come in as really the true users of this, you know, tool, and they can really dictate what actually works really well for their students you know, what really works well for students themselves, and that as technologists, it's rather challenging and difficult for us to be really prescriptive about how teachers and students should be really using that tool, because I think oftentimes, you know, we are really surprised by somehow, uh, by a tool and how it's actually used inside of education. Like, I'm not so, sh I, I can't speak really on behalf of Google, but I think we're all a little surprised at how, like, Google apps for education really blew up, you know, in the education space. I, in a positive in way. A really right? po in a really positive way, yes. Uh, but I think, you know, they didn't go, they, Google didn't start in the very inception of Google Docs being like, yes, we're going to go and create a really, really powerful collaboration tool to be used inside of schools. And I think this is kind of where the creativity of students and teachers come in, in terms of they will be able to find what tool really works well for them, and then they will always latch on to the ones that really support their learning objectives. Esther, did you want to jump in there? Well, actually, I, yeah, I do think that teachers do need a little help in that area, which is part of the reason why you know, I think that we have this online program to help uh, from Google, that I have that online program, and a lot of other uh, resources to help teachers. And I mean, TESS has a lot of resources to help teachers, because I know as a teacher that the number one thing that I don't have is time. And so whatever can help me is what I'm going to use. And so, you know, we appreciate all those videos that everybody makes and all that all that stuff that, that really makes a big difference. So let's talk about preparing teachers a little bit, because of course, in the United States, we talk a lot about professional development for teachers. As you said, teachers do not have any time. They have negative amounts of time, right? Because they That's lose their weekends right. and their evenings and everything else. I'm guessing the same thing is true around the world. Yes. And what have you seen about how teachers around the world are learning to use the technology to support their students? What? What are there, are there things that are easier? Are there things that are harder for them in a global setting? So can I just respond to that? Please. Yeah. So my goal is really to help t teachers see that the number one people to help them are their students. And if they could just ha level the playing field here a little bit and ask their students if they could possibly work together as a team then it's all going to work really well. And the teacher won't work as hard. And so that's the basis of my program. Those kids know a lot more than I do, I can tell you right now. And they're all there right now working while I'm here talking to you. <laughs> and so, um, but they're, the reason they're doing that is because they're totally motivated. It's their project. They own it. And so as long as the kids own the learning, they're going to work really hard. So anyway, what I'd like to do, getting back to your teacher question, which I diverted from, mm -hmm. um, let's, that's the main thing. Can we help teachers see a different way to teach? They don't have to lecture all the time. They could actually be 
just a guide on the side. Great. Anybody else? So uh, just a quick point uh, about we have a lot of teachers on Edmodo, but about half of them actually don't bring any students on. And they're on the platform because they're using the other teachers to learn from. So they're asking a ton of questions. They're asking for help. They're asking for suggestions. And to me, that's an interesting uh, counter, whatever, not exactly a counterpoint, but a supporting additional point to uh, Esther's uh, viewpoint, which is that you should be using the people around you, whether the students in your classroom or the other teachers that you are connected to, to try and learn how to do things better. Yeah, I agree with that. They should use each other. But you know, it's interesting. Teachers are kind of, they're afraid to admit to other teachers that they don't know what they're doing, sorry to say. And so there's, it's easier to admit it on a platform, online platform like that. So <coughs> you're somewhat distant. But um, I think I think we need to help them say it's okay if you don't know all this stuff. Really, you don't need to know it all. Jamie, do you see anything different in the way uh, teachers internationally are using Google and Google Apps and, and all the whole panoply of things that you guys are offering? Anything different about those interactions than what you see in the US world? Uh, yeah, actually, I wish I my memorization skills were better today because I read an article on the way up here this morning about uh, teachers in the UK, and it, I don't know if you saw this, but it was a study around what are the impact, what are the things that are impacting teachers in the U UK, and, and low pay was like way down the list. S uh, not having time to do things was up on the list, and so I was reading that article thinking, I wonder how they're using technology, what are they doing, how can they use technology to make their time better? Because like Amy said, my, I, you've heard me say this a thousand times, technology is not the silver bullet, right? Nothing at the end of the day is better than having a great teacher in a classroom. Um, that's the most important thing that we can do in education. However, how can these teachers take technology to create the uh, support and enabling capability that they can they need in the classroom? And I, that was my first question when I was reading the article. Was thinking, I wonder. I actually reached out to the UK team. Like, what? Wh how are teachers using technology in the UK? What are the issues? Can we? talk to them about ways that they can save more time in the classroom by not only empowering their teachers, but taking advantage of all the technology that's in front of them, that they have available to them. Amy, you, Tess in uh, England is huge. You touch virtually every teacher in the UK and, and more broadly around the world as well. Uh, do you, um, what do you hear from the teachers in the UK? Do they feel they have enough support? Do they feel overwhelmed by the technology? I mean, I think, you know, if you were to ask that question to any teacher, they'd probably say yes to all of those things in terms of, you know, I think there's commonalities of just, you know, being really short on time and really needing that support. So I, so I think those are almost, you know, global attributions um, in terms of regardless of where you're teaching. You know, I do think there are some differences in, in um, being part of TES, you know, I spent a lot of my time, you know, in the UK and also interviewing teachers um, in the UK where, there are differences that exist between the education system there where there are, you know, far more regulated standards from, um, you know, a government perspective, you know, where than there is here. So that means they follow a very, very specific curriculum. That's, you know, and then there's always, you know, pros and cons on either side of the fence here. Um, but I think what that kind of that structure allows is, you know, they have one common, I would say, language in which they all kind of speak in terms of what their students kind of need to be performing at, you know, regardless of where you're going within the country. And so I think that ends up kind of helping the teachers a bit more than I think there is here from a support perspective because they have one common language of assessments that their students need to be gearing up for at a specific time. Whereas here everything is a little bit more fragmented, you know, from state to state and also even within the states um, where it's a little bit harder, you know, for teachers to kind of rally together simply because they are speaking, you know, a little bit of different languages depending on kind of where you're physically located. So we've been hearing that technology is great for helping connect teachers who are in uh, very far-flung places. It's good for helping connect the students, and as Esther said, perhaps even using the students to lead the teachers. Um, and um, the other thing, the, the point that Amy was just touching on is fascinating. In the United States, technology has become a story around testing. Now, what about the rest of the world? You started, I think some of you started talking about using technology to authentically express themselves. 
Are you seeing better use of technology internationally by students and teachers to express themselves, to do projects, in contrast to perhaps simply testing? Mm -hmm. Teeing that up. Was you want to go for it, Esther? Right. So this book I wrote, Moonshots in Education, so we had a conference in um, Amsterdam last year. It was called Moonshot Summit. And 60 pe people from around the world came to that. And one of the groups, of course, was the Dutch in the Netherlands, right? It was held in their country. They're now implementing this whole philosophy of collaborative project-based learning. It's kind of interesting. So talk a little bit more about that, collaborative project-based learning. How are, how are the Dutch doing it? So they have, they've, have more, well first of all, they're training their teachers. And I think that that's the key to, it's okay for you to not actually do some of the things that you were talking about, not to have a structured curriculum where everybody is teaching to a particular um, test. Actually, they are teaching to a test. So um, they're going to, th they still have tests, but in fact, the, the kids are doing projects that relate to the information that is on those tests. So it's embedded in the project. And that doesn't mean that they've given up lecturing because I've decided teachers will never give up lecturing, you know? <laughs> it's just the way it's inborn. So um, they only lecture about 50% of the time or maybe 60% of the time, but they do have an opportunity to work on these projects and the teacher training is the key. Um, we can see, uh, they're gonna be doing it this summer and we're gonna be, I'll, you know, hopefully we'll post videos about what's going on there. The actually the same thing is taking place in France. The French are pretty interested in doing it and there's a company here that is working in France that's helping do that, Hapara. I don't know if mm -hmm. anybody knows about Hapara. Yeah, they do great stuff. And, right. um, and then also in Switzerland. Vibhu, are you seeing this kind of project-based learning? Is that discussion going on in the international realm of Edmodo? I'm actually, so the short answer is yes, but I'm actually going to add an example that isn't Edmodo because I think it makes a lot more uh, compelling case for collaboration, which is Minecraft. So if you've seen middle school kids, oh yeah. they're creating entire worlds. And my I have an 11-year-old who at one point, I think, spent weeks creating ancient Athens. And you know they went around creating essentially a brick by brick recreation of some of the more famous buildings in Athens. And I think as a result, he learned a lot more about Greece uh, and how about how to collaborate with people than I think I've ever seen anybody do in the past. Jamie, has Google gonna support this? Well, I, so I think that you know if we think about global competency skills, right? Not just about what's going on in the world, but students here in the US understanding the world, you're not going to do that with a test, right? You're just, you can take a test about, you know, tell me what the big buildings are in Athens, tell me, who, you know, who the presidents were in this country. You can do those types of things, but until you build real global competency skills that are focused on, you know, empathy and understanding and asking questions, right? Those are the kinds of things that we got to get to. Um, I, I got to spend, uh, a couple years ago, I got to spend about six weeks in Africa. And you know, I just it, it, that was the first thing I thought of when we talked about the transformational experience that you had, uh, and it was I was just blown away by the whole experience. But I remember thinking that's when I really got more involved in global education. That's when I joined the uh, New Global Citizens Board directors because I realized that a lot of what we're t teaching kids in the U.S. is getting them to memorize things and 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 uh, you know have have knowledge and facts in their heads when reality is they don't really understand the people and the culture and, and really empathize as to what they're going through and it, I remember thinking we we take a bunch of kids in the US we put them on a plane and matching t-shirts we fly them to Africa and then they go build a school and they think they've actually accomplished anything and in reality they probably got five guys off of off the five guys <laughs> didn't get jobs because their kids were building the school right and they didn't really understand the the, the experience and it, it would be like having the Masi uh, warriors come here to downtown Palo Alto and we'll look around and say, look at all these poor people. None of them have cattle. And then they all of a sudden start breaking up the cr ground so that they can get cattle for all the poor people that are walking through Palo Alto, right? So having that understanding of, of, of culture, and understanding that, that's why I got more involved in global competency. And you can't get there with tests. And, and so from a good, that's a Jamie perspective. From a Google perspective, we're hoping that things that we do with being able to collaborate with Google Apps, being able to see 
you know, take road trips with Google Expeditions, those types of things that we can bring more people uh, into the realm of understanding everything that's going on in the world, not just their perspective. Great. I'm going to come to the audience in about five seconds for a question, so get ready. Esther, you were going to add something? Uh, how did you know? Esther <laughs> 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 has the when don't look you on my face. Um, so, you know, there's defining global competence, you know, right here in this uh, little brochure that comes out here. It's called, number one, investigate the world. Number two, weigh perspectives. Number three, communicate ideas. Number four, take action. Just think about what kids do when they do journalistic writing. Number one thing, they investigate the story. Try to find all the information. Number two, weigh the perspectives. What's most important? What's not important? Number three, can you communicate orally and ri written? And number four, take action. Can you write it up and then see what you're going to do from there? So that's why I say that this curriculum works really well for getting kids informed on all fronts, not just local issues, but international issues. I mean, my kids are worried about what's going on in Syria. And um, all kids should be worried about that. You know, it's, uh, it's unbelievable. What a tragedy. So anyway, I just wanted to add that. Absolutely. Let me go to the audience. Does anyone have a question? Want to move the conversation in a different direction? Oh, I do. Oh, how exciting. You reset the clock. Yay. OK, so you need to go to the mic. You need to be brave. You need to be collaborative. Lucy, do you want to get us started? Yeah. <laughs> I can share. Uh, so my question is, um, it, Ed Surge came out with a report recently about how things are being funded in Silicon Valley, right? In terms of ed tech, there's a, a bubble going on, and people are pretty excited, and I'm thrilled. But those 32% of, of the money is going towards things that are geared towards school operations, right? Um, things that will make things easier for teachers in some ways, I'm sure. But how do, why is there, what's telling those investors from your perspective that that's lucrative for them? And how can we get more investors interested in technologies and tools and things that will help students and teachers collaborate online and pursue those, um, those four pillars that you were mentioning? Um, Esther, that's my question for you. I know it's kind of a loaded question, but if anybody wants to try it. Yeah, I'll take that from a ed tech entrepreneur perspective. So, um, you know, prior to being acquired by Tez, my company, Blend Space, you know, def I definitely spent many t hours on the hills of Sand Hill Road, s somewhere around here, you know, pitching to investors. <laughs> and I think as being a first time entrepreneur myself, you know, not all investors are the same. And I think there are quite a few handful of investors, which actually I will go ahead and plug Ed Surge's podcast, because I was actually just listening to it while driving down from San Francisco. They just did a spotlight series on a couple three about on three different types of investors. And I think those ones, they're very like-minded in all of us in terms of we're also all very mission-driven. Like we all chose to be in education technology because we wanted to make a positive impact in the lives of teachers and students. And we didn't decide to go you know, work for uh, or work in other types of industries that are more perhaps more lucrative. Um, but I think engaging in these like-minded investors is definitely one step you know, to, to ensure that your, your goals are aligned. You know, but granted, there are a bunch of investors out there who are funding at tech companies who aren't, who don't have those things, you know, aligned. And, you know, where they look at a company and it's, like, very much a growth model and they try to start pattern matching, like, oh, does this look like a Facebook or does this look like a Dropbox? But they're not really understanding that this is actually the education system and it's really different, actually. Um, and they need to be asking those hard questions and also be able um, to really look at the time scale, because I think things in education, they do just tend to move a little bit slower than there is in enterprise or consumer world, and so these investors really have to be aligned with that and understand all the various nuances there is when you are backing an education technology company. Yeah, I, I just want to add, the because the I saw that report and I read and we talked about this, but the, the idea around what the uh, community is funding versus where it should be going are two different things. And, and I think a lot of it will come from parents. So for example, you know, talk about five years ago, the idea that we would be teaching computer science in our schools was a dream, and it's still not anywhere near where it needs to be. But yet, when we, look, when we talk to parents, nine out of 10 parents want their kids taking computer science. 
I bet you we start surveying parents and we get into them, how many of you who have kids want your parents or your kids to have a global competency education, right? So I think a lot of it is how do we communicate with the, with the parent community about what's out there, what, what they should learn. I th bet you most parents would want their kids to study. That, and I think that'll come through technology from the kids. And I'll give you a quick example. Um, this idea that kids um, are connected with people all over the world already at like 13 years old. Like, you know, we were stuck with the five kids who lived on our block, <laughs> right? Um, you know, those are the guys, we had to put up with the five kids. My, my 15 year old has friends all over the world and, and one, of one particular friend that he doesn't have, that someone who won the, go the Google Science Fair one, she, saw, she wanted to solve a problem that her friend was having, her, one of her best friends who happened to live in the Philippines who didn't have electricity and she was upset that her friend didn't have electricity and so she invented a flashlight that's powered by the heat of the human hand and she's 15 years old, right? All of a sudden you start seeing it from that perspective and what, who kids are engaging with and the stories that they're telling and how they're engaged with communities all over the world. I think that, so I, I think it'll get there. We're, we're just starting to see that, that uprising. So I'm hearing a fabulous story of kid empowerment, right? The kids can be leading our educators. The kids should be connecting with each other. The kids should be connecting with resources. And, you know, maybe Silicon Valley doesn't always have the right answer. And it, and it just real quick, while somebody's <laughs> coming up to ask a question. Is, I, hey, look, I, I, I tweeted out this morning every time I, I live in Phoenix, so I don't live here. Every oh time yeah. I come up, I tweet it out, uh, I smell kale. So <laughs> the... Um, <laughs> the um, so, so you know, part of that, part of that is you know asking asking the kids better questions, right? Like you know, one of the things that I talk about all the time is instead of asking kids what they want to be when they grow up, ask them what problem they want to solve, right? And what problem spins in their head, right. and all of a sudden these problems get to be global very quickly in 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 the solutions that they need to that need to be created for them. So I think that's that's where it's going to come from 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 uh, an empowerment perspective. Kids today learn different than the way we learn, right? Like my 15-year-old learned how to code all on his own. We waited for things to be packaged for us and, and to be official where kids are just teaching each other uh, on an ongoing basis. Or they're teaching each other with YouTube videos. <laughs> 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 okay, another heard. question. Don't be shy. If you're shy, you have to listen to me. Yes, come on, you can do it. Come on, Mike's up here. Don't be shy. Um, Stand close to the mic, though. Okay. Well, my question is actually kind of along the same lines as uh, what we were talking is about. Is that mic on? Sorry, I just want to make sure. So there's no doubt that technology um, will exponentially increase uh, children's access to education, knowledge, and overall even um, intellect. Um, the more exposure they have to knowledge uh, and, and important questions, the greater their understanding of the world will be. My question is, as technology is rolled out to more affluent schools first, and then slowly trickle down to the less affluent ones, how will we address the achievement gap that might be an unintended consequence of bringing these programs into some curriculum but not into others? Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's a huge issue, right? It's this idea that we had a digital divide before the invention of the iPhone. Um, you know, we need, it's maybe even getting worse, right? So how do we make sure that that doesn't happen? And so it's not even a question of equal access across the board. It's a question of equity access. And some, some communities need more services. I mean, there's community, there's this great report. I wrote an article about it, about the, um, the lack of internet connectivity at home. Uh, and, and parents and families of, uh, that are living in poverty not having access to technology, not having access to broadband, even though the report will tell you like, you know, nine out of 10 families do, but what they're counting is, you know, a, mobile, a mobily connected device that one, one family is sharing, right? So that's not the same thing as how mo most of us have broadband at home. So making sure that we have connectivity in schools is number one, making sure that we have the technology access at school, because if they're not getting it at school, w we, we can't make the assumption that they're gonna get this experience at home. So we have to, that's absolutely on top of mind. We have to focus on that. Yeah, I think number one is really what you just said. They need to all have uh, access at school. And surprisingly, I don't know if you know the statistics, 
but I, oh, I think it's only 50% of American schools are wired properly. 50%, that's a little shocking to me. And um, so I think that's something the federal government should be involved in and in making sure that all schools get the proper wiring. Um, and then I think that teachers, again, are afraid to use the equipment because they don't feel like they're experts. And so um, you can spend a lot of time on professional development and giving them all these lessons and so forth, but that's why I say the easiest thing of all is just hand out the computers, the laptops, and like, okay, kids, go at it. And so I think that's kind of the theme of this panel, which is you have to be a little brave, and perhaps the people who are going to be most brave are going to be our students. We should look to them and listen when they are asking for access, when they are asking for opportunities to reach out to colleagues, and uh, we, should, uh, we should pay attention, we should listen. Please join me in thanking this panel. Okay, there will be a break after the next panel. Of course, we're not gonna stop you if you need to go take a break, but we're not gonna have a formal break. But do turn to your neighbor now and continue that conversation or find someone new to tell about your most transformative global experience. And the second panel can now come up. Okay, so some of you are gonna know this part of my story, but I'm gonna keep talking until you stop talking. But when I was, when I graduated from college for five years, I led group tours and went all over the world. And one of the things I learned as a tour guide is that the bus always leaves on time. Do you know this rule? The first day the bus has to leave on time because if you leave late, then everybody thinks it's gonna keep leaving late. So today the bus leaves on time. And we're gonna get started, Jennifer. Hello, good afternoon. Hello. My name is Jennifer Russell and I'm with Iron USA, the International Education and Resource Network. First, I wanna just give a huge thanks to Lucy and Steve, who I'm meeting for uh, in person uh, the, for the first time after four years of participating in the Global Education Conference. So it's really an honor to be here and to meet you um, and to participate in this event. Um, we have a great panel. Um, oh, there he is. <laughs> we have a great panel um, for this session where we're going to be focusing on planning and prioritizing at the leadership level for global competency. So, of course, advocating to put uh, global competency on the agenda and um, garnering support um, and defining it um, are the first steps, but then actually implementing it and doing the work um, and supporting schools and teachers and students to be globally competent is um, another challenge. So um, we're going to hear from a variety of administrators and education leaders today about their approaches um, and some of the successes and challenges that they've had. 
Um, so here with us today we have uh, Dr. Brandon Wiley, who is pre president of Global Ed Leader, um, and Dr. Tony Jackson, uh, the vice president for education from Asia Society, um, and David Young, who is with VIF International Education. He's the CEO. It's good to see you. And um, Claire Yvonne Lee, who is the executive director of the Global Oneness Project. Um, and in this panel, we're going to pick up on a couple of the threads from the first panel. Um, but I'm going to start pretty broadly um, for whoever wants to take it first um, with the first question. And it, that is, how can schools ensure that all students receive an international experience as part of their education? I'm, I'm Looking at David <laughs> first. <laughs> all right. Um, well, yeah, so listening to the, the earlier panel, um, there were a lot of, lot of great points. and. Uh, and then looking at technology and the, the potential for how technology can extend global learning much more broadly is, is um, it's, it's a great opportunity for, for all of us. Um, let's just uh, take a minute to think about some of the statistics. So um, one of the things we know is uh, many of us here, uh, our, our global experiences are likely rooted in some travel, probably some study abroad. Uh, some of us probably worked in other countries um, and had those opportunities. Uh, the reality is that's pretty rare. Um, when we look at uh, the percentage of U.S. citizens that travel uh, outside of North America, it's, it's extremely low. Uh, about 30% of us have passports. Um, it, it appears you get a lot of different uh, numbers, but it appears that only about 15% of us leave the continent. Um, we know that uh, only about 20% of us take a foreign language. Um, in, in, uh, in our current public schools. Um, we know that teachers, um, as education majors, study abroad at almost the lowest rate of any major. Um, only agriculture majors study abroad at a lower rate. Um, so when you start looking at the, the, the numbers and trying to figure out a, how do we extend these kinds of opportunities to all students, um, we have our work cut out for us. And the first thing I would say is that, um, you know, there's a lot of us here, but we're really not that many. I mean, we're talking about less than 100 people here trying to, to push this work. We've got our work cut out for us, and, and working together is going to be very, very important. Um, just to give a, a thought on, on one uh, particular uh, statistic that's a, a, a little bit disheartening is, you know, everybody loves IB, and, and IB is incredible. It's wonderful. Um, but we have 140,000 schools in the United States, and, and we have 858 IB schools. I mean, so we're really talking about a 99% a issue here. How it's a 1% versus 99% issue. How do you get to the other 99%? And based on the earlier panel, I, I think you know one of the clear things is technology gives us the opportunity to really extend well beyond the 1%, but we've got to figure out what that looks like um, and how to make it happen. Great, thank you, David. And I wanna pass it next to uh, Dr. Tony Jackson, if you would, um, from your work building right. the Asia Society, the Global Competence Matrix, and then how are you working with schools um, then in implementation? Well, I mean, um, I think many of you may well know that Asia Society has had a network of uh, schools in the United States that have been internationally focused, the National Studies Schools Network for some time now, about 45 schools altogether. And I think one of the things that I would just add is um, if we want young people to have international experiences, both going to someplace else or um, having it virtual, it has to be a priority, it has to be built into the school design. And that, that's been our, our sense of it, that, that it can't be sort of um, that which is you get to when you have a time or you know, a special opportunity. But if, if, if it's valued deeply, then it needs to be that part of the structure of the school that doesn't get you know, kind of washed over, which means from a structural point of view that there actually has to be somebody whose job it is to make sure that there's opportunities for kids to do that. And I know that's difficult, but I mean, again, these are difficult choices we have to make. And it also um, means that it has to become part of the culture. There's a, you know, certain expectations that kids will have and their parents will have that, you know, the three or four or five years that, uh, well, depending on what kind of school it is, but w when my child is in this school, I can expect that they're going to have interactions with people from other cultures in a very authentic way that may involve going to someplace else. At the very least, though, it would be that they have opportunity to do that on a regular basis um, through a virtual technology. So I just think it needs to be hardwired into what we think school is about. Brandon? Yeah, I'll, I'll just add on that a little bit by saying, uh, whenever I have an opportunity to talk with superintendents or principals in particular, one question I ask them is, how do you define success for your kids? Right, when they leave your school, what's a success look like? What do you hope that they'll know and be able to do and be when they leave you? And first of all, if they don't have an answer to that, we have a problem, right? <laughs> 
Uh, second of all, if they do have an answer and it does not include the types of things we're talking about today, then that's also a problem, right? If they're talking about rankings or test scores or, or even graduation rates, which today now is the low bar in my mind. Uh, now it's not about getting kids to graduate high school, it's about their attainment of a college degree and beyond, right? That they're prepared for college and career. So first of all, there has to be a commitment at the leadership level that global competence, developing students' global competence is part of the definition of what success looks like. And it starts there from a leadership perspective. And then uh, I totally agree with everything uh, Tony said about the, the DNA of the school and having to be sort of baked into the structure. But I also think there has to be sort of a continuum of entry points for schools and districts to get started. In other words, there's no one way in particular for a school or a district to begin to try to bring global in. And so uh, th the continuum can include a lot of different things. It can include things like partnerships. Mm -hmm. It could include travel, but very often it, there's an equity issue involved with travel. It's not for all kids, it's for some kids, mm -hmm. right? And so on that continuum, we have to think about whether it's partnerships, travel opportunities. Uh, for me, where the rubber meets the road is where are we really bringing global into the curriculum, instruction, and assessment, right? A and a very deep level, how do we build that in of a student's experience? Uh, and then lastly, there has to be a plan. Right, and so I think, uh, to answer your question, I think if there isn't a strategic plan where we've defined global competence and, and this ability for students to engage with the world as part of our definition of success, we haven't created the different entry points for schools to think strategically and in bite sizes, mm -hmm. then it doesn't happen. And then lastly, we need a strategic plan to kind of guide that work that's transparent that everyone can buy into. Thank you. I'm gonna turn over to Cleary now um, with Global Oneness Project. If you could share some yeah. of your perspective. I would just add a little bit to what Brandon was saying. And from my perspective as a curriculum writer and taking it to the curriculum level, building in um, opportunities for teachers to build in interdisciplinary uh, learning. So I'll just share a quick um, experience just that happened last week. I just got a, an email from a teacher who's an environmental science high school teacher who's using a short film that looks at um, globalization and consumerism. Um, and they're working with a high school teacher in the same school who's studying a, a post-apocalyptic story. And so the two t classes are merging together. And I think there's a lot of different examples that we can explore on an interdisciplinary level, but that's just a start. Great, and of course, at interdisciplinary level, you're going to need the, the big support from the, the leaders at the school to make it coordinate and make that happen. And I, I wanted to um, get your perspective on working with school leaders. How do you in encourage them to make global competency a priority um, a in, in their schools? So what, any sort of success stories or challenges that you faced in working with districts or school levels to bring that in as a priority? Well, I'll, I'll just I'll just start um, and be brief about it. I mean, I, I think really on what has been said, but Brandon particularly, I think um, to the extent that you can both make the case for why global competence unto itself is critical is part of the reason, part of the way in which you engage leaders in this work. But I think also there is a real need to make sure that it's not orthogonal to what they have to do in their daily work. And, and, and so it has to be seen as not only by, by school leaders, but particularly by teachers, as that which is going to enhance their capacity to do what they have to do. And so we, we sort of think about there being kind of two intertwined gaps that we have to worry about, the achievement gap and the opportunity gap. The opportunity gap being that which has to do with you know, whether or not you're getting the capacities to be able to be a part of the global economy, to be able to really be able to you know, work within a global environment in terms of collaboration and so forth. Um, but if those two things don't come together, um, then you have, you know, uh, you, you have for people forced to make choices between them, and you can't, th that's not gonna work. And so to the extent you can blend these things together so that people can see doing project-based learning that it brings in international perspectives, international problems, issues, as a way to infuse you know, the learning of the core content within even the, you know, the common core, that to us is the way in which you, you make this you know, a palatable, um, useful thing that I want to do for my kids, and also because I need to make sure that, particularly from an equity standpoint, all kids are making the achievement gains they need to make to make sure that they get the coin of the realm kind of uh, outcomes they need to be able to go to college and so forth. So blending those two things together, making sure that you're on point in both instances, I think is, is really critical. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think global as a lens, as opposed to an additional subject, uh, if it's the lens through which teaching and learning occurs, I think that that's a, 
a, a better approach. What we've seen in, in the schools that we're working with is that if you can integrate into all subjects, um, so a math teacher, a science teacher, a elementary ed teacher, all of these teachers can learn to integrate global concepts into their teaching. Any subject can be globalized. Um, so I think, I, I think learning uh, to, to uh, help teachers to do this work is critical. And, and giving teachers the professional development and the resources to be able to, to move in this direction. I think, I think principals need to see that it, it's not just something else, right? I mean, they're overwhelmed. And so uh, if global can be part of what they're doing, as Tony says, um, I think that that's a, a better approach for all of us and we can make more, much more progress. Thank you. Yeah, I, I would just add that, um, first of all, I think being building principal is the hardest job in the ecosystem, <laughs> right? Having been a district office guy myself, I can tell you their jobs are the toughest. And I think to, to David's point, I'm sorry? Made I made it the toughest. Yeah, maybe that's why. <laughs> I hope not. I hope I cleared the way, actually, for them. But, but the, the reality is um, there are so many demands on schools right now in terms of accountability and the things that we're expected to do. So the question is how, uh, to Tony's point earlier, how do we not make global education one more thing on the plate but the plate, mm -hmm. right? So that's the lens through which we see everything that we're doing in the school. And I think the word that I use very often is intentionality. How are we intentional about the things we're doing with students on a daily basis? So when you really unpack this idea of global competence, investigate the world, weigh perspectives, uh, the, the d domains that were shared in the earlier panel, like what does that actually look like in the classroom? What are the, what are the teacher moves? What are the strategies? What are the activities that a teacher can use to engage students in those four areas? When you can really break it down to that level, then it starts to help people understand like this isn't something new I have to learn. I might have to do some, some nuance. I may have to be a little more intentional with what I'm doing uh, instructionally. And a lot of principals that I'm working with in coaching, uh, frankly, you know, they have this long list of things that they're responsible for every day, one of which are teacher evaluations. Right? I don't know a principal actually that isn't uh, overwhelmed right now by teacher evaluations. Mm -hmm. And so when you really unpack what are you looking for when you go into classrooms, whether it's student engagement, the questioning strategies you're using, you know, this whole myriad of things you're looking for, actually when you teach with a global focus in your classroom, you're able to address those things much more intentionally and purposefully. So it's not one more thing, but it's the thing <coughs> that actually gets us to the outcomes we're looking for. So I think really helping leaders understand what that looks like and creating this mental image, this mental picture in their head of what it looks like uh, is a really critical piece. Well, I would just add what Jamie was talking about earlier, which is, you know, it's a mindset. It's like, what problem do you want to solve? And I think that's a question not just for students, but I think it's for all of us to really think about as we think about the different kinds of um, resources and, and strategies for, for building global education right now. Great, thanks, Claire. And that leads to my next question is, is how do all of us get involved or how can school leaders build in um, involvement from the community, from parents, um, and, and uh, to garner support for building global competency into the curriculum and making it a reality for students in the class? Well, I can start Great, um, real quick, but I, um, a couple years ago, about four years ago, I had an experience where I was sharing um, a film with Chicago Public School teachers. And the film was really based on um, a violence in Ecuador, basically gang violence in Ecuador. So this really hit home with Chicago public school teachers. And um, what was the most valuable thing about that is that afterwards we had a really emotionally charged discussion with the teachers in the room. Um, and what came out of it was that the teachers had um, an idea that let's bring this film back to our communities, let's share it with the parents, let's share it with the students, let's share it with the organizations, everyone that's involved, and let's try to come up with some solutions. And what also came up is that, yes, this is scary, you know, uh, some principals didn't even want to go there, and that's realistic, but I think to have those conversations is a good place to start. I think we, we've also seen some examples, and, and Tony can s certainly speak to this, where this type of focus can really be transformative in a community, and the school is a centerpiece of that. And so I'll give a shout out right now to uh, the Aurora Public Schools in Colorado that are just beginning this initiative, working with the Asia Society. Mm -hmm. And so this is a community that is extremely diverse. Uh, many of the schools have upwards of 40 languages spoken in the, in the building. And so as a community, they're seeing this diversity driving the need for the schools to be responsive. 
And so in a sense, uh, they're addressing actually a lot of things in the community that for many years maybe had not been spoken to. By So in this partnership, they're really not only helping to celebrate the diversity, but also leverage it to give students opportunities to learn more about themselves as well as cultures that are different than, than themselves. And I think we've seen a lot of examples where we can engage the community in that way. But, but I would say, not to be devil's advocate, but, um, and I'm also not going to be political here for a second, but I think we've seen in this political climate right now that there is a strong sentiment in this country that actually going sort of the other direction is where some communities would like us to be, where, where actually diversity is not celebrated, mm -hmm. where learning about different cultures is not uh, something that's seen as a priority. So I just want to put that out there because I think as we think of this country broadly, uh, there are some communities where this is not valued, and so I think somehow we have to break through that to talk about Again, what's a success look like for our students in, in, the, in this 21st century, in this global society? You know, uh, from what I recall when the internet came out, there were people who said, oh, this is a fad, that'll go away. You know, how's that going, <laughs> right? <laughs> and I kind of feel the same way about global. Like some people are like, oh, well, this is just a fad. Well, the reality is our society is going to be much more global, not less global, as our kids go into it. Mm -hmm. So I I whether we like it or not, whether we want our kids to travel, we want our kids to learn different languages, that is the world they're going to live in. And so as schools and as leaders, we have to be able to communicate about that to our constituents. I think it's, un it's sometimes easy to underestimate parents. Um, we, we work with a, a school district in eastern North Carolina that is amongst the lowest wealth districts in the entire country. Um, and and they were trying to figure out, okay, they were hemorrhaging students. They were losing all their students to private schools and to charter schools. And they were trying to figure out what can we do to attract these students to return uh, to the district. They were about to go basically out of business. And they, they looked at Avenues. And, and everybody here probably knows Avenues, the world school in, in New York, which is incredible. Um, it's, it's what probably every one of us would want our kids to have in terms of an education. And, and they said, you know, that's, that's where we're going that's what we want to do. And, and this is a place with 90% free and reduced lunch. Um, it had been uh, destroyed by a hurricane underwater for, uh, for months. Um, and, and they had to make a comeback. And what they did was went to their community and they, and they pitched this concept of globalizing the entire district. To start with a, a, a single school that was going to be a flagship school that would be a K-8 uh, model in which they would have dual language, they would have a global curriculum, they would have international teachers, they would train all their domestic teachers to, to integrate global themes. And, and they, they, they announced this in January of 14, hoping that they could get 300 kids to sign up. And by March, uh, they had 500 kids that signed up, they had 100 more kids on a waiting list. And that program's now a year old. Uh, and they've extended this program to every single school in the district. So it's, it's, a, it's a global district. And recently I was able to go to a community event to celebrate the progress of this district. They have saved that district. That district is, is global from top to bottom. Uh, students are excited. Parents are raving. And they have pulled almost every single kid back from the charter school and about half from the private school. Um, it, it's been transformative. And so. I think that one of the things we all need to remember is that, um, that, that technology affords us now the opportunity to take the things that we all do well and extend them at scale to all kids. Um, and I think that that's the critical piece now, is how do we move from the lucky few to all students? And you know, that's where we're dedicated uh, to, to, to moving as an organization. And, and I think that as a group, if we can do that, uh, we can make a lot more progress. And so related to that, um, what are some of the challenges that you face, um, and kind of pulling off Brandon's point as well, reaching those areas that are harder to reach, or those areas that are um, under resources, or perhaps any other issues that might come up with equity um, in terms of uh, making an international experience possible for, for students? What, what uh, approaches have you taken um, in, in the past? Um, I think there's a couple of things to think about with regard to equity. Um, I, I think, first of all, we need to sort of take a, a big picture view of this, which is um, when we think about what we want kids to learn in terms of global competencies, that is the 21st century equity issue. Because if kids do or do not have the, the cognitive capacities to be able to you know, be analytical and curious and, and, and have critical thinking skills to get them in the global economy and both for their own you know, uh, ability to make a living, but also to raise up societies and begin to sort of do something about this ridiculous bifurcation of income and wealth, 
then, then they as individuals and society at large is going to go down the tubes. And the same thing happens with regard to sustainability issues. If we don't have kids who are able to actually use their inventive minds and make a difference in the world around sustainability issues, and even more so around things like prevention of, um, of, of violence between cultures uh, and, and, and the sort of racking pain we have in the world now around people at, at, at sort of each other's throats because they don't understand each other. Th these are survival issues for the society and for individuals. And so I just have to sort of say, we have to realize that this is not just a school issue. This is the issue of our times. Mm -hmm. And so we have to sort of regard it that way. Um, and, and, and I'll just say one other word about equity. Um, I've, I've actually thought a lot about kind of, you know, what would happen if we actually achieved equity? Um, you know, and, and so certainly you would have a lot of kids. And I, this is a little bit from a blog post I, I put in today's ed Education Week, but you would certainly have a lot of more kids of color and, and kids from impoverished backgrounds who would be part of the global economy and part of the set of solution makers within the world. But I think I, I was trying to reflect on what it would mean as an individual. What, it, what does it mean to be globally competent and what does it mean to be equal in a global context? And to me, there was three things that really stood out um, when I thought about my own experience and however much global competence I've achieved in my own life. Um, and one was um, that you, 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 you developed what actually W.E. Du Bois spoke of t 100 years ago, of, of a dual consciousness. Mm -hmm. And in, in today's world, it's a multiple consciousness. But it's, 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 it's the empathy, it's the understanding, and the ability to see from somebody else's point of view, again, not as a nice thing to be able to do, but because it's, it's a survivor skill. That was what it was for black people in white America for 100 years, or thousands of years now, or hundreds of years. And I think all of us now have to develop that same capacity to be able to understand each other from a very deep perspective. It also is a, uh, to me, it's, it's, it's sort of turning off the primal urge of classifying somebody different as a threat. And so if you have the capacity to sort of rein in or replace that kind of sense of, of everyone who is not like you and not from your tribe is going to be a threat to you, then that's, that's what it means. That's what equity and equality means in a global context. And I think the last thing I would say is that, it, to me, global competence means global confidence, that you actually feel as though you belong in these conversations either at the boardroom in New York or you know, in, in, in classrooms around the world, that you, you, you don't feel as though you're not rightfully there, even though this conversation is nowhere where you would imagine yourself being when you were a child. Mm -hmm. So those, those things to me are what it means on a felt experience level to be globally competent and, and, and globally equal. And I just want to, I just think we should think about that in, in terms of like how we, how we express this need, um, both from a personal and a societal level. So that's what I would say. Yeah, it was fantastic. And by the way, it was fantastic, uh, uh, Colin, today. And thank you for sharing that. Um, I think the uh, one of the challenges we have is, is how do you ultimately get at scale? E equity, I think, in, in global is about how do you extend this more broadly to, mm -hmm. to all students. And I think there's two opportunities there, and, and both relate to technology. Technology gives you the capacity to scale and deliver uh, training, deliver resources uh, to schools and, and to teachers. Um, but it also allows you to stay um, cost effective, to keep costs low. Um, a lot of the, the challenges we face around global is just pure expense. And so the two things that I think are, are critical is, is integrating uh, using technology and keeping costs down. And then in that sense, we can take global away from being just a magnet school and making it available to all schools. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I was exactly where I was going. Unfortunately, in a lot of school systems around this country right now, policy and practice are getting in the way of this. And I'll just give you two very quick examples. Uh, in many urban school districts around the country, public school systems, there is this opportunity for school choice, right? That students can actually vie for different schools and where they go. I grew up in a town where there was one high school, that's where you went, come hell or high water, that was your choice. But in a lot of urban communities, students are provided this opportunity to bid or to, to choose. And unfortunately, we don't always do a very good job of helping communicate what those choices are particularly for English language learners mm -hmm. and for families that are new to the community. They're not educated on what those choices are. And so we start to c perpetuate some of the inequities by virtue of some of the schools being magnet schools that have a global focus and other schools where that's not the case, right? And so it starts to sort of perpetuate this idea that global is just for some kids, not for all, right? Mm -hmm. So that's one very concrete example of how a policy mm -hmm. within a system perpetuates the gap. Uh, the other is at the school level where actually uh, there's, there are tracks, right? There's a global academy 
or there's a global course, but you can only take the global course if you get these other four courses done, mm -hmm. right? And so already students who maybe academically are struggling or maybe aren't uh, as far along, that's not a pathway that's an option for them, right? So I think the structures and systems we put in place at the school and district level have a lot to do with the perpetuation of these inequities. Uh, and I'd also say this is true for teachers, but which we haven't really talked much about, I think the next panel will get into this, is that for, for us to really expect this to happen for students, we need to develop teacher and leaders global competence, mm -hmm. right? And so there's a lot of systems that are not making a commitment to make that part of their not only definition of success, but in terms of providing time for teachers to collaborate, professional development that develops it. And so again, that just further perpetuates this gap. So I think as leaders in this room and those of us that are gonna go beyond and work with leaders, we really have to make this a priority and have people look very closely at the systems and structures they put in place and how are they enabling global education to happen, not limiting. Okay, thank you, go ahead, Courtney. Well, I just wanna expand on what Tony said on a, on a personal level, and I can't recall who wrote this, but education is the ability to meet life's situations. And I think that's why Steve asked this question in the very beginning is being able to share, you know, what what is your powerful global <coughs> experience? Because it, we all know what it feels like to, to leave the country for the first time and to have that, that vulnerability come up. And it, it really is a life-changing experience. So how can we create that for students who don't have that possibility to, to leave the country, but with technology today and the resources that are available, there is a way to create that and to bring those universal values into the classroom. Great, thank you. I'm going to ask one more question and then turn it over to audience questions. Um, so get ready. Um, and my last question is actually, Brandon read my mind, um, which it was going to be, I've seen it be very powerful for teachers to have global co connective and collaborative experiences and for school leaders to have those experiences as a driving force for then um, making those experiences open for students. Um, would any of you care to share about an experience that you have in connecting perhaps with other education leaders um, internationally or globally um, and how that's impacted you professionally? Okay. I'll just share um, just a quick um, experience. We um, connected with some teachers in Thailand who um, were using a short film of ours and it was the short film was just describing what's happening in Louisiana. So, you know, the small island that's kind of sinking into the sea. And so what they did with their fourth graders um, is they used this film and the fourth graders reflected on it, kind of reenacting um, what's happening on this island. And the end project was the students used Legos to recreate the scenes. So that was a, a creative moment, even though our you know, resources aren't really built for elementary students, but, but the concepts are. And I think at that age, at 10 years old, I think um, it's quite accessible. Thank you. Anyone else care to share? Go ahead. Um, well, so for we're, we're entering our uh, 30th year in a week. Um, and uh, in that time, we've brought 12,000 international exchange teachers to the US from 77 different countries all, all around the country. And and all of these teachers come in for a period of time, but then ultimately they go back to their home countries. The idea is that they come here, they share uh, their culture and language with our students, but ultimately have a very um, um, important uh, US experience and then go back out to their countries and hopefully share that for the rest of their careers. Um, what has happened and, and with technology, and we had the question about five years ago, what could you do, uh, what could you not do then that you, you can do now? And, and so we've been able to now connect these 12,000 teachers to um, domestic teachers that are training to, to integrate global content. We can do these classroom to classroom partnerships with teachers who have been here, understand the US education system, but are back home now. And they want to connect their classrooms back to the schools in which they taught uh, or other schools. And so, so this opportunity to create these virtual um, collaborations is, is really growing and real. Thank you. Just a quick word, actually about a different program with an agency society called the Global Cities Education Network. And this is a network of school leader, uh, school district leaders, urban school district leaders in Asia and North America. It's kind of a learning community for those folks to think about what common problems and policy they have at that level. But the one thing I would say that I, I've been amazed from that is how universal this issue of wanting our students to develop these global competencies is. 
I mean, this, this is not a conversation that's just happening in the United States. In fact, it's happening maybe even more in a robust sense, mm -hmm. a dy dynamic sense, in other countries. It may be called, you know, different things in different places, but the idea that we have to fundamentally transform our education system, and it's really interesting because you, you go to a place like Hiroshima, where they have this absolutely fantastic sort of diagram of how they're going to change their system. It's going to be globally focused, and they're going to create these things called super global high schools. And you say, well, that's great. How are you going to do that? And say, well, that's the part we haven't quite got to yet. <laughs> but <laughs> but we're going we're gonna to get there. But I mean, I'm not, I don't mean to be derogatory. They, they are know that they're going to get there. They've got an idea. And so they want to be part of a global conversation to help them get there. And that's actually, if I can put a quick plug in for something we're doing at Asia Society, we're creating something called the Asia Society Center for Global Education because we want to have a global platform for this kind of conversation and constituency building around global education worldwide. And so come September, we're launching that because we have seen this phenomenon worldwide and we want to begin to harness it to develop constituencies of support for this work everywhere. Thank you. And, I, and I'll just synthesize what I think all three of them said is that teachers and leaders need networks, right? And so I think Steve and Lucy have done an amazing job through the Global Education Conference of creating this global network over the last half dozen years or so to really s have teachers and leaders engage with one another to think about this work. And so I think of networks sort of on three levels, sort of the three R's. One is around relationships, that networks give us relationships with others who think of the work the way we do mm -hmm. and th to give us the opportunity to collaborate. The second is around resources. You know, we're living in a time of diminishing resources. And so to the extent a network can can contribute to one another and that your ideas feed my ideas, the things you've created are things I can use as a teacher and leader. And then the last one is this idea of resiliency, that like teaching is hard work and increasingly for teachers and leaders, it's getting harder with all the demands. And so how can these networks then provide us the resiliency that we need to do the right things for kids? And so I think the examples that they gave are really powerful around how these networks can help us do that work. And I'll just do one plug too, in addition to the Global Ed Conference, uh, this Fall again in October, we're going to have the second Global Education Forum at the University of Pennsylvania. Many of the organizations here today are, are in part sponsoring that. Last year we had about 400 educators from around the world representing 26 states and 16 countries. And so this is an opportunity for any of you that would like to engage again in this sort of a format over an extended period of time. The goal there is to really try to elevate the best practices of what's happening around the world and, and, and kind of the premise of learning with and from one another. Uh, instead of this idea of competition. So uh, information went up today at globaledforum.com, so we hope some of you will join us at that. Great, and thanks for putting the plug in. Um, now I'm going to hand it over for questions. I'm going to start. Uh, Great, go ahead, Steve. I, I was really hoping somebody would bring up the uh, dual language immersion school concept. How does that play into this, and what do those do that uh, gives them such strength and power? Um, thanks, Steve. Uh, I, th I think um, so. We run a network of 60 schools uh, that are are in in North Carolina that we support uh, in a site-based way, and then also work in in Houston to support their dual language initiative, which is which is significant. Um, they opened 55 dual language schools in the last two years. Um, the the data is staggering. Uh, I think you've all probably seen it. Uh, the students uh, they're they're learning their core content in the target language. Um, and it not only means that they're going to build extraordinary proficiency, but we've seen great gains in cognitive development and executive function. Their test scores are up 25 to 30 percent uh, across all, all uh, uh, groups. Um, and it doesn't matter if it's rural, uh, doesn't matter if it's urban, doesn't matter if it's wealthy or low wealth, it, it works in every situation. In addition, there, there are different models. So you have full immersion, which is 90% of your, your, um, your core content would be taught in, in the target language. So typically those would be English speakers that were taking all their core content in either Spanish or Mandarin. And again, extraordinary results. Um, but, but the model that's probably uh, uh, very, very effective and cost effective uh, is, is called 50-50 two-way immersion in which half of the students are typically going to be Spanish speakers, half are going to be English speakers, um, and you put them into the same environment, you switch the language 50-50, A day, B day, or half day, half day, or subject by subject, and the results are staggering. The ki the, the, uh, typically the, the, the Spanish speaking students will have their language and their culture validated, um, the English speakers will learn about another, uh, another culture, another uh, way of life, and, and they, they support each other in learning each other's language, and it's really an extraordinary thing to see. Um, I think that uh, 
you know, it's kind of exploding right now. I think you all have seen plenty of articles. Um, it's, it's, it's the way we should be learning languages in this country. I mean, many of us took three years of X and can't speak a word. <laughs> um, and uh, unfortunately, you know, it's a $5 billion industry that we continue to, to operate, a, a language industry that, that has about a 99% failure rate in generating proficiency. So um, if you look at uh, what you can do, I think we should start pushing on that. We should start saying that we need to get more return on our investment in traditional world languages and dual mm -hmm. language, dual language immersion is clearly one of the, the, the best ways to, to go. I think it also starts with expectations. So in other words, in, in some communities, students who come to school not able to speak English, English language learners are seen as a problem to deal with instead of seeing it as an asset to celebrate. And so if we lead with the idea that students who come to our schools not speaking English have an advantage in the sense that if we can help them develop their English language capacity, they will at least be bilingual, which is further along than I am. I can barely speak English most days, <laughs> right? So, so the reality is, in s but, but we don't think of it that way. And as a teacher, if I don't have training or expertise and strategies in helping those students, again, it's seen as a problem to be overcome instead of an opportunity. Mm -hmm. And so I think part of it is expectations as a school and as a system, that that's something we expect for all of our students, and we will build the structures and supports to do it. Uh, unfortunately, and it's many cases when the budget cuts come, it's world languages that are the first thing to be cut. So that, to me, communicates very clearly about whether or not we hold that as an important outcome. I saw a question. Yeah. Hello. Um, I have a question about how you've seen this global learning initiative happen both in schools and continuing into and out of the school, into the home, and so that the person, the learner, takes this into their their life kind of essence, right? So um, what I've seen a lot is things are going on in schools. Parents are putting a lot of responsibility on the schools to teach something, to make it all happen. W have you seen any effective programs that link both the s what's going on in the schools and what's going on in the home, and then opportunities for those students just as part of their weekends, part of their life, to get more of this type of information embedded into their, into their system? Not exactly, <laughs> <laughs> but <coughs> no, I, I, I must admit I, I haven't seen um, the extension to the home per se, but I mean a, a, a lot of the work we do at Asia Society, or another p aspect of the work we do at Asia Society is to think about the informal learning systems that are out there and how do you actually use those as a means to um, advance global education. And so we've done a lot of work with YMCA's and what, you know, the, the Boys and Girls Clubs and, and particularly state after school networks to really develop a toolkit by which um, they then can, in their normal programming, which is often, you know, has a, has a higher level of flexibility than kind of school-based programming and school-based learning, um, use, t take, take the global uh, an, an initiative, as it were, in that context. And so we've done a lot of work to really provide that community, those communities with the tools and the understanding and the competencies and the definitions and so forth, that that can be extended in that space. Um, and then there's actually also a, a number of occasions when um, schools and, inf and, and informal learning uh, organizations in our communities work together. And so you do have that kind of, you know, double whammy, it, you know, a, a couple of hits on, on kids to be able to uh, un have this opportunity, not so much necessarily at home, or they may be extending that there, that I just don't know about that part, but um, in their school and after school work as well, they're getting a double dose of global, which I think is really important and an effective way to, to develop their capacity. Can I, can I add an answer to that? So d does anybody here know Larry Ferlazzo and his program with the Hmong students in Sacramento area? I, I think he's probably doing something you'd be interested in. And if anybody knows more about it than I do, please feel free to connect with Marcy. But uh, bringing computers into the homes, uh, providing the language material, and then discovering that the families are benefiting as a whole from that activity. Okay, well, um, our time's about wrapping up, so I wanted to uh, say thank you to our panelists for sharing their wisdom and expertise. Thank you. And Great job. Hey, thanks, everybody. Okay, now you do have a formal 10-minute yeah. break. Uh, keep that conversation going about transformative experiences, and we'll come back. After the last panel coming up, you'll have lots of networking time.
Steve, if you're available, please come to the check table. Steve, if you're available, please come to the check table.
All right, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, from your cockpits. We're about five minutes until we begin our approach process into our next set of presentations, actually our final panel of the evening. So once again, this is your five minute warning. Please go ahead and make your way towards your seats. We'll be beginning our descent here in just under five minutes. Once again, we'll start promptly at 6 p.m. If you can go ahead and grab your seats, we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you. All right, good afternoon, gentlemen. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, we have about a minute and a half until we begin our next presentation. So if you can go ahead and make your way towards your seats, we want to begin promptly at 6 p.m. Once again, we have about a minute until we begin our next presentation. We are on final approach. Please go ahead and take your seats. Fasten your seat belts. Put your seat back and tray tables in their full upright and locked positions. We'll be beginning our descent shortly. Everybody, everyone's now snacking, getting drinks. I have the unwelcome job of luring you back to your seats with no candy or treats. Um, so my name is Dana Mortensen. I'm the co-founder and executive director of World Savvy. It is really fun to be here um, in a room full of like-minded folks who all celebrate global education and are doing such important work in so many different ways. So. It's, an especial, it's a special privilege to be um, moderating this panel. Um, World Savvy was founded 14 years ago to help um, embed global competence into teaching, learning, and culture, and was founded here in the Bay Area, and Mill Valley teachers were some of, among the first to be part of our programming. Um, so I'm gonna let each of these individuals introduce themselves. They are superstars in their own right, but the, the, to sort of set the stage, one of the reasons I wanted to bring together this group was to sort of underscore a really important point, which is that if we subscribe to the notion that there is no silver bullet in transforming education to embed global competence, then what really becomes necessary is finding meaningful ways at all levels within the system 
to work together. And so this group represents a really functional team that's been able to do that. How do we look at student engagement? How do we examine teacher practice and capacity? And how do we work at the leadership level and have all of those um, working together to sort of change what the experience looks like for learners? Um, so everyone on the stage is from the Mill Valley Public School District. Um, and in various ways has been immersed in the program that we've offered. The first was a um, was formerly called the World Savvy Challenge and is now World Savvy Classroom. So really engaging teachers and students in project-based learning around complex global themes and problem solving in diverse teams. And we also have a privilege to have two students on the stage, students that are the graduates of the first cohort for a, a master's level global competence certificate program that was um, jointly developed with Asia Society um, and Teachers College at Columbia University and graduated this past December. So hopefully we'll get to hear some best practice from what they learned there as well. Um, so with that, I want to ask you each to just give us a brief introduction, who you are, a little bit of your background, and what your role is within the district um, that positions you to affect change around embedding global competence. Okay, I'll start. You're stepping on the mic. <laughs> Disconnected? No. Hi, my name is Anna Lazzarini, and I am the principal of Mill Valley Middle School. I uh, have been at the school. This is my 22nd year. I was a core teacher in the classroom, um, actually teaching with the, as a partner to the teacher who first introduced World Savvy Challenge, World Affairs Challenge, to the district as a club, and have watched it grow over the years, and I feel privileged to be a part of this team. Um, hi, I'm Paul Johnson. I'm the superintendent of the Mill Valley School District. Um, I've been a superintendent for 15 years. My previous district in the Sacramento area, um, we opened a brand new um, international baccalaureate school. Um, and here in the Mill Valley School District, I'm just excited to support really enthusiastic teachers and administrators with uh, global studies. And, uh, and I wanted to say, too, that I hear that Edmodo is going to sponsor all of our teachers' lounges to look like this. <laughs> <laughs> Wine. <laughs> Wine and candy. Um, my name is Maggie Front, and I teach seventh grade social studies and language arts and a sixth grade class called Connections, where we help kids learn to connect to themselves, their community, and the world. And I'm also one of the GCC graduates from Columbia University, and I've been teaching, gosh, since the turn of the millennium, is that what we say? <laughs> I'm Rod Sepka, and I teach uh, seventh grade English and history at Mill Valley Middle School. And I also teach a course called Global Citizenship and Debate, uh, which um, we just started. Uh, this is our second year have, having that course at the school. I also did the GCC certificate program. And um, I started uh, this whole process working with the World Savvy Challenge as the club leader after the original person left and uh, was so impressed with the program that I thought, why is this a club and not part of our school? So um, shared that information with uh, some of my colleagues here and um, we wrote a grant uh, for our school to get people training in at the World Savvy program. That led to some of us doing the GCC, and it all came because we had so much support from our administration, both at the building level and at the district level, um, that we were able to do that. Um, so we're really fortunate. And I'm Brandilyn Patterson. I teach math and sometimes science. And I am privileged to be a part of this three-member team uh, this year. We have started a global teacher inquiry project, so we're looking into how to scale global education at our school. Fantastic. Thank you all so much. I want to start kind of at the 30,000 foot level in terms of the ecosystem that we're dealing with here and think about what it means. Um, Brandon was talking about intentionality and what does it mean to start at the administrative level or even more broadly the set of stakeholders that are interacting with the district um, in Mill Valley and to think a little bit about what it looked like to get buy-in for this kind of initiative um, and to talk e generally and specifically about some of the steps you took and maybe some of the things you confronted along the way. Um, sure. Um, what we did is around four years ago, we uh, went through a process where we interviewed uh, community members. We had about 18 focus groups, um, ranging from athletic coaches to high school teachers to our staff, um, uh, parents. 
and then we conducted extensive surveys to compile information to come up with a strategic plan and a vision. And seven key themes emerged from um, our planning, and one was around global education. Um, first, changing our vision to include uh, global citizenship, and then also uh, putting an entire strategic goal around global studies and global awareness, um, and tying that with global inquiry. And so that became the foundation of the school district. The school board bought into it. Um, the principals all helped to create it. Um, actually, Rod, you were on the um, steering committee, and so everybody had buy into what our vision was because it's definitely, di it's very difficult to go global as a school system or district-wide. And one thing that has helped us is we quote the strategic plan quite a bit. <laughs> and you know, this is one of our priorities. Remember, we all put this together. Um, but it's very important that there be buy-in all the way from the school board um, through all the administrative ranks. Um, so I think that's helped us and um, I think it's helped us to not just be in our own little independent pockets um, and so that we're trying to work together as a team. And if I can just do a follow-up on that and ask a little bit more about maybe the role parents play or to reference something in an earlier panel, this idea of making the case. So what were the sort of things you pushed on to make the case for why including global at the district level was such an important priority? So from the parents in uh, the panels were comments like, Mill Valley is just in its own little bubble. Um, foreign language instruction at the elementary level and all the way up through um, the different uh, classes. Um, learning to understand the world around us. Comments like that came from the parents. And then we took that, we also used uh, Tony Wagner's The Global Achievement Gap as a basis for study um, during our planning. And we used some of that and we just designed that from the comments um, and uh, you know, put that together. Great, thank you. Um, so now I wanna move to sort of looking at um, successes and best practices and actually as an, from an administrator viewpoint in supporting a culture where teachers have time, space, opportunity, and tools to do this. Um, so sort of how did you approach that, Anna or Paul, Anna, um, so that that um, was something that teachers didn't feel um, oppressed by initiative fatigue, as so often happens for teachers. What did that look like? Fortunately, these three teachers are never fatigued, no matter <laughs> what the initiative is. Um, it is it is something to consider, though, because we're in the midst of you know Common Core implementation and NGSS implementation. We're also going one to one with technology, rolling it out eighth grade la this year, seventh next year, and sixth grade. So we have several things going on, but this was really important to us. As it is, as Paul mentioned, part of our strategic plan, and we had a, have a lot of support from the community. We have a great board and a great community who really values education in, in high levels, and um, you know, Rod and Maggie and Brandilyn are able to create things and creating a, a team that works with the same 120 kids um, and doing an interdisciplinary social studies, English, and math. Um, you know, it, w it was a little bit of work to create a master schedule that provided them all with the same prep period and the same number of, the same exact students, um, but it has been quite worth it, and um, it has been something that we, it, it's been interesting and, and incredibly um, satisfying to see the kids develop the projects that these, teachers have created with them and um, to just even be in the classroom hearing the different conversations and the level of the conversations um, about like equity of education depending on where you live. I mean this, this is a lunchtime conversation I'm hearing kids talk about and I'm like these are seventh graders and you know three years ago they would not have been having this conversation during rainy day lunch. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, it, it has been Yes, it's work on all of our parts. It's uh, been a ton of work on their part because you know one prep period four times a week for an hour does not create the program they have implemented. And so it takes a lot more work on their part and they are dedicated and committed to making this a success, which makes my job easier. 
So let's talk about that commitment <laughs> and talk about from your perspective, maybe a little bit more detail on how you've actually structured this interdisciplinary collaboration. We've heard a lot about how much peer support and leaning on other teachers and the time and opportunity to talk with other teachers is, is critical. Maybe you can describe what that actually looks like um, for you all as an interdisciplinary team and how you work to put that together and, and connect. Well, it starts with a, um, a whiteboard or a very large piece of butcher paper and a lot of markers and just huge brainstorming sessions last summer trying to come up with, well, we knew what our inquiry question was, but what were the things that were important to us? What did we need to peel off? What did we need to um, blend together? And how, how could we take math, which in our minds I think was probably the most difficult subject to integrate and really make that part of what we were doing? I think it also came from, you know, we're integrating content, but we're also integrating common systems and a common way of looking at things. So sometimes we have cross-curricular projects that really do take the math into core, take the writing into math, but other times it's more about having a growth mindset and fostering that in all of our students through all of their classes, or teaching them to see things from different perspectives, or to what honor what other students are saying. So it goes further than just, just the actual content. There's also that other layer of all those other things that sometimes are discounted, but, but that are equally important. I think um, for us, one of the, the big things is a shift in uh, what we see our job is as an educator in the classroom. Um, instead of looking at the narrow scope of the, the specific content, um, as people in our earlier panel spoke about, um, information is at your fingertips. Uh, it was looking at broad themes and uh, big ideas that we wanted the kids to be able to take away with them and then uh, designing a curriculum that was relevant and about the real world that would then link back to the content. So starting with what was important first and then working towards the other aspects of it. And I want to build off that and ask a question. I think Esther brought it up earlier about this idea of moving from kind of sage on the stage to guide on the side. or um, And because this really represents, teaching for global competence represents a pretty significant shift in teaching practice, right? Um, when I was in middle school, it was sage on the stage. The content that was delivered was pretty much what I knew if I didn't get something different at the public library. So your focused work on rethinking that and, and looking at your own practice pretty deeply and taking steps to, to change it, to accommodate this kind of learning. Tell us a little bit about that journey um, and what how your practice has actually changed to accommodate this. Um, well, for me, it's my the change in my practice has been transformative. and. I'm working really hard to be a mentor with my students rather than their teacher. And it, that seems like semantics, but it's really not. It really is very, very different. It means getting down with them often, um, letting them, or I shouldn't say letting them, they are the expert in a lot of things, learning from them, and creating a climate where we're all learning together. And it's really hard to set aside, you know, 50 years of what I've known as, as what it means to be a learner. But it's, I'm seeing a lot in my students. I'm seeing them step up. I'm seeing them be more respectful. I'm seeing them value their own voice, which I think is really important. Well, the, the, the obvious sh short answer is that assuming you have an hour period, which sometimes you have a little bit less than that, I spend no more than 10 minutes talking, which for me not to talk for more than 10 <laughs> minutes, if you know me, is pretty much a feat on my part. But you know, the students don't need me to give them information. That's what Siri's for. They all just ask Siri. <laughs> what they need is to figure out how do I reflect upon this information? How do I synthesize it? What do I do with it? And that's kind of the focus. And once again, it's, it's a big shift, and it's easy to fall back into those old patterns, especially when you're pressed for time. But developing those relationships with students, utilizing technology so that you can individualize instruction, giving them a voice and a choice. So at the end, you are going to need to present this. How you do it is up to you. iMovie, slides, web page. You decide, and actually, guys, I don't know how to use any of these, so you have to figure it out on your own and teach your neighbor, and then come to me and show me when it's done, and we'll talk about the thought that went into it. At the same time, I think it's not, um, 
it's not to say that as a teacher you don't lay the groundwork, um, that that is still incredibly important, but the way um, in which you deliver the information um, and set the stage is a lot different. So um, we spent a lot of time developing cooperative groups, talking about how you work together with others, um, planting the seeds, uh, directing them to the right sources, um, helping them make decisions about what is reliable and what isn't. Um, and um, those kinds of things uh, take a lot of time. And being really clear what our intention is going into any kind of a project, I think uh, one of the ways in which we shifted is um, project-based learning and inquiry has been around for decades, but in the last 15 years, it sort of disappeared completely uh, from schools in general, not necessarily from individual classrooms or teachers, but it sort of was no longer important. And I think um, World Savvy did a great service in keeping it sort of at the forefront uh, of what they did and the way in which they um, wanted teachers to be interacting with their students. And I think we all benefited from being reintroduced to that kind of teaching and learning um, that has affected the way in which we do uh, what we do. Yeah, please. What, what they're describing is what all teachers should be doing, especially with the new Common Core standards and the NGSS standards. It should be inquiry-based, it should be student-led, it should be problem-solving rather than giving information. And so uh, Brandilyn, Rod, and Maggie are model teachers in, in their ability to embrace that and to make that happen for their kids. And it really has made an impact on the students and the families. They have done, when they did a, the project about water, they had all the families come in and the kids had to share it with their parents. And they had this big exhibition in the library. And as the parents were leaving, they were just floored at the depth of level of knowledge that their kids had and the solutions that they had come up with to, uh, you know, to fix the problem that they had found in the water system. And so I think that this is, you know, this is great stuff that's going on. Yeah, no question. So just in, let's l focus a little bit on the student experience. You know, between you, you have uh, more than 30 years of teaching experience, or on the stage, more than 50 or 60. I don't know. I don't want to tack on too many years. <laughs> a lot of teaching experience, suffice to say. So just thinking about over this, the progression for yourselves, as your teaching practices change, as you've seen the environment change, what is the student experience? How does it look different? You know, and, and how does it sound different? And, and what about the environment more broadly feels like there's been a change in what it feels to be like a learner um, in the school system? And it, specific examples are great too, if you've got them. I think one thing that's really different is um, kids see themselves as actors, that they're in school to learn something so they can take action and not just um, receive information from the teacher. And I think that, for me, is really different, too. The kids see themselves as um, purposeful, and they bug Anna <laughs> a lot about changes they want to make in the school um, because they feel like they have a voice. Um, they see things um, that they're learning about, and they're being much more uh, inclined to think about what they can do to solve the problem. And one example of this is, we, we started the year talking about water. That was going to be our big thing because of the drought. Uh, we had no idea that Flint would come along um, and uh, many other things uh, concerning water in the past year. And so the students, we, we've done a lot of work around that. And um, after several weeks of talking about the Flint crisis, them looking at it in their math class and the English class, we looked at some images on the screen and one of the students, after looking at the images for a few moments, said, wait a second, <coughs> is this about race? Because the images and the photos of the community are a more racially diverse group than what we have in Mill Valley. And that was a catalyst for that student to say, this is an equity issue. Um, it goes beyond a water crisis. Let's do something. And she started working together with other students to try to figure out a way to raise money and to do something um, to address that problem. 
and she went from there, being a student not so engaged, to then thinking about um, just being a girl in our own school and what that means. And now she's working on a project to share that with other classes and students in the school. And I think building on that, it's also motivated her, like many of my other students, to become a self-directed <coughs> learner. She's realized that this is really important and if I don't start taking, you know, looking at myself and taking the initiative and learning some of this and thinking about some of this, I'm kind of gonna be left behind. And so she's really stepped up. She's started doing her assignments, turning in her assignments. And we have a lot of students who all of a sudden they feel this connection and they realize that, you know, this is, this is the time for me, for me to step up and I'm in control of my own destiny. And this is what I'm gonna do. This is how I'm gonna make the world better. This is how I'm going to learn for myself. <coughs> and they just take off. Yeah, it's been really fun to see. Right now, um, my class is in the middle, actually yours is too, Rod, of, of um, doing projects where they're looking at a, a problem at the global level, um, regional level, and the local level. And then they're trying to solve it at the local level with something that a 12 or 13 year old can really do. And it's been fun to watch the process. Um, for example, I have this group of four boys and they are very rowdy and hard to kind of corral. And they started out with, with looking at the condition in the around the world in prisons. They had heard about Guantanamo Bay and I think they really just wanted to watch the prison videos on YouTube. <laughs> so they start watching these videos and making all these great notes and having these questions and then kind of are starting to think about that requirement where they have to do something as a, you know, in their own community and it's like, okay, maybe prisons, that's not gonna work, I don't know what I can do. And then they went from there to looking about the school to prison pipeline because, well, that has something to do with schools and I'm in school. And again, they, they felt a little overwhelmed but with that, but, uh, but they learned about it. So now they've learned about the condition of prisons internationally, you know, in the United States. They've learned about this idea of the um, school to prison pipeline. Then they got into restorative justice and thinking that could be a solution. Well, one of the, the boys in the group was, he works with the restorative justice at our school. And he says, you know, we're kind of already doing that. So if we do something there, that's already being done. So what they decided was, okay, we're gonna make it so kids in our school don't get in trouble. That'll be good. That'll be something we can all use. <laughs> and the way they're not gonna get in trouble is if they love coming to school. So their solution and is, and again, remembering these are 12-year-olds, is that um, they want to reimagine school. And they're redesigning it from the ground up. The, you know, the fly on the wall here was really enjoying the part about the food trucks at lunch. <laughs> but they also were talking about, you know, flexible classes and they were getting into some of the current research on um, adolescence and sleep. And so they're really seeing how complex everything is and how interconnected everything is. Th that was making me think about um, the perspective of the students and um, we tend to all believe that we understand our community pretty well and um, we were talking about in my global citizenship class we were talking and looking at um, gun violence and um, Obama's um, uh, speech and what he said about gun violence in his proposals and plans. And the kids really felt like in Mill Valley there was one perspective about guns. Um, but they weren't sure. So two of the student, three of the students went out into the community with a video camera and they did a documentary. They set themselves up downtown Mill Valley and they interviewed people across a huge spectrum of um, Mill Valley residents. They must have interviewed like 60 some people and then they they cut this um, these interviews down into a about a t 15 minute video where they they started with some of their research and then they cut to what people in the community had to say and the diversity of, p of opinions was huge and then when they shared the video with the class we were able to have a discussion about just what is our community? What are the other perspectives that are present around us? And what does that say about the complexity of the issues that we're facing? Great, thank you so much. Um, so you're a highly functional team of teachers and administrators, I have to say. 
<clears throat> which is um, wonderful, but not always the norm, right? It's some, th these things are challenging. It's hard to work together sometimes. And one of the things about global competence is it's hard to teach for it if you're not modeling it, right? It's hard to teach collaboration if you're not great at collaborating. So in thinking about um, just how you've managed to do this together sort of as a larger system and thinking about those districts and schools that want to go global and set on that path wherever it is they're entering that journey, what are some of the most salient lessons, best practices, things that you would sort of pass on as this was really a crucial thing to think about to make this work um, from your perspective and your role? Well, my observation is the things that the World Savvy teachers are doing is the highest level of instruction possible and the highest level of student learning uh, because uh, inquiry is the highest level of teaching. And when students are coming up with their own problems and then producing their own solutions uh, to those problems, that's like fun teaching. That's very stimulating. Um, it's what you talked about where the, where the teacher becomes the facilitator in the class. Um, and so I think for some school systems, it's just going back to what is really good teaching. And really good teaching is inquiry-based instruction um, to guide students. And I think just going back to that, it's using that as the foundation and then uh, what has become of it is that the globe is the stage. And then uh, our teachers, uh, uh, Maggie and Rod, went to Ecuador because they you know, jumped up onto that stage and there's that whole, which is really magnificent with um, how that happened. But I, to, to me, it's just going back to good teaching and then remembering that the g world is the stage for information uh, for students. I agree with all of that, and I'd like to just add that, you know, you also, at least in our, my experience and in our district, it always works better when it grows from the teachers. And so this came from, you know, Rod doing World Affairs Challenge with Judy for a couple of years and then seeing the opportunities and World Savvy then creating curriculum instead of just doing the challenge. And you know it grew to Maggie, and then it grew to six seventh grade core teachers, and then it has grown to sixth grade teachers and eighth grade teachers. So in a matter of three years, we've had 10 of the 18 core teachers we have trained in World Savvy who are now implementing and infusing parts of it into their regular curriculum. And so I think that when you get, when you grow it from the teachers, the excitement that comes from what they're doing and others seeing what they're doing is what creates more interest in advancing that. Mm -hmm. I think that for our school district, that works much better than if it's a top-down thing. Success breeds success. I was gonna say, we modeled a lot for our students and we're pretty open about it. So our three classrooms happen to be side by side and we're always in and out of each other's classrooms and we're asking for clarification, we're asking questions, we try to come observe each other when we can, even if it's only five, 10 minutes. We're very open with our students about, we met yesterday, your three teachers met yesterday. This is what we decided. This is where we would like to try. What's your feedback? What's your input? So we're getting input from them. We're letting them know that this is new, letting them know this is important. And then once again, we model, hey, we need planning time. Just like you need collaborative time, we need collaborative time. And that's why we're gonna be out tomorrow. Or that's why our doors closed at lunch and we can't meet with you today because the three of us have to talk because we really want to make this work, but that means we've got to focus right now. And um, I think students have been impressed by that. I'd like to say at least they've, or they've been shocked. They've been, you know, they're taking it, oh, you actually talk to each other. <laughs> yes, we do. And sometimes it's about you, but sometimes it's about other things. But you know, that's kind of a, a shocking revelation for a middle school student is that, oh, your teachers talk. Yes, we do. And um, they seem to also appreciate that. You know, hey, you've got a, a big assignment due, so there's gonna be less in this class. So I think they're really feeling the, the yeah, they're, they're, they're feeling our community as well as their community. And, and just to add to what Anna said about um, it growing from teachers forward, um, I think the two things that really made it possible for us is that we feel safe to take risks and fail because we know that our administration is going to support us. And I think you need that, just as kids need to be in a safe environment to learn, teachers need to feel that they're gonna be able to try some stuff. Um, and the other thing is, um, 
that, and with that then comes the ability to take a risk because this is very risky because we don't know where it's going to go and it might just totally fail. Um, and so you g have to just jump in and do it without really knowing exactly where you might end up. So those two things, I think, go hand in hand. And I think probably, since you took all my points, um, <laughs> the um, seeing, seeing setbacks or failures or pushback, seeing those as opportunities is really big. And, and again, the support ne network is key. Um, we were kind of in a funk for a couple of weeks, and one day Brandon walks in, and she's like, oh, we're not doing that growth mindset thing we keep telling the kids they have to do. And she was right. You know, we were really stuck in this way of, of we were so tied to the result we wanted that we couldn't be flexible. And just being there and supporting each other and helping each other grow, I think, has been huge. That's fantastic. And we've run over our time, actually. Well, not, oh, not over. A lot of great things to say. But if we want time for a Q&A and some questions, and just to congratulate you guys again on your tremendous work. Are there any questions from the audience? <laughs> Yeah, can you scream or? Is that one working? Oh, it was working. Oh, yeah. Hi, everybody. Um, some educators say says that in the future, technology will take us to have um, uh, like the teacher, the, the the figure of the teacher, more as a mentor and. Uh, to teach kids to gather information because informations are all over internet, right? So, uh, like, what are your thoughts about this, first of all? And second, for, for administrators, um, would you prefer to have kids that come out of, of your school with a good pack of information or with the ability to gather and look for information and to use tools to gather those information that they need. I'll take, I'll take it. Um, I think that in the in the future, I would be delighted if if um, students had mentors, and if they were able to go in and harvest the information. I think developmentally, they still need guidance in how to ask the right questions, how to evaluate their sources, how to be able to apply what they want to say to their audience. So I think there's always going to be the room for that, that mentor teacher, um, whatever we want to call that person. But I would like to see more of that, the responsibility for the, the hunting and gathering of information really become the venue of the, of the student, where so that they can come to an adult or to someone else and say, help me learn from this. As an administrator, I would much prefer to know that our kids are problem solvers and resourceful in finding information than just feeding them information. That is just not the way the world works anymore. And even when looking to hiring teachers, you know, I, I want to have teachers who are resourceful, not teachers who can just talk the talk. I would say, Photo math solves all of the math problems you have, but if you can't ask the question for photo math to solve, you're in a lot of trouble. So I think, you know, like I said, teaching role is shifting, but it's still an important role, and there's still, there's, there's guidance, there's mentorship, there's still quite a bit of it that goes into it. That was my only note. <laughs> yes. The suspense really builds up. The <laughs> quality of the question has to follow. <laughs> right. Hopefully, that the suspense will be good enough. But um, so, thank you first of all for all of you for being here. Uh, how do you think about students helping other students and the peer-to-peer -peer element of how does it supplement what teachers do, or from a principal or administrative's point of view, or even a teacher's point of view? I'll go. Um, well, first of all, students need to learn collaboration skills because that is in the marketplace now, as witnessed by this open floor plan on the other side of the building. And so um, one of our goals is to help students be able to work in teams, collaborate, uh, learn different perspectives from one another um, in their research and their uh, interactions. 
Yeah, I mean, that's extremely important. I think um, as a teacher, modeling that we're learners too is, is really essential. And it, uh, I had the opportunity this year because I teach a combined seventh, eighth grade class and the eighth graders have one-on-one -on -one iPads. The seventh graders don't. The kids in the eighth grade class are really much more expert at it than I am. They were able to do something. The eighth graders were able to share with the rest of the class great apps, great things that they were able to do, and they were able to show me how to make these things work in the classroom. So it became an environment where the playing field was fairly equal in terms of everybody learning from everybody else. And um, I think that the we've had some really great opportunities um, for the kids to see that people bring different strengths to the table, and if we design our lessons and our inquiries in the, the right way, you can have a very diverse group of students working together and they can celebrate the strengths of everyone. Rod, I saw you facilitate a student-led Socratic <laughs> seminar too, which was totally fascinating to watch. I think went on the, that was great. Any other questions for the panel? Yeah. Hi, my name is Kim Jacobson um, and I'm with the Full Circle Fund and the iZone here in San Mateo County. And I don't know if this is more of a question for you or, or for you guys, but you said you moved from a challenge-based model to a global curriculum. And I'm curious kind of what the difference is and why did that enable you to switch from it being a club to a, yeah. a class or is that kind of, how did that work? Actually more of a branding issue. It just used to be called the World Affairs Challenge and is now called World's Heavy Classroom. So it's, it's always been a project-based learning model that's problem-based, challenge-based learning. Um, so that hasn't changed very much, and a lot of the curriculum that's developed around that is really a credit to the, to the teachers. I don't know if you want to jump in on that. But then maybe how does it work as teachers teaching a curriculum that comes from somebody else? How does that work in what, what is the curriculum part of it? Uh, so um, the, the uh, World Savvy um, Organization uh, um, has chosen themes over the years for kids to design inquiry projects based on. So for a period of a few years, it was sustainability, which is wide open across um, all content and subject areas. They worked with um, educators to develop curriculum that they could share with teachers around these broad ideas um, with resources uh, connected to it. And then it becomes just another tool for the teachers to access, um, to think about these broad ideas. I don't know if that answers your question or not. But I think one thing that happened when it went from the, um, the branding of a challenge to more of a classroom product was that it felt more accessible to teachers because it didn't feel like a competition of some kind that they were having to enter their students in. That's, that's true. I think be before, my, before I actually joined into this um, part of the World Savvy Challenge was the kids took a test on their global knowledge, I think, yeah. in the beginning years of this program. And um, it's evolved from that to um, last year's World Savvy event. The kids were part of a global community, sharing with one another, listening to inspiring speakers, sitting in roundtable discussion groups with kids from schools across the Bay Area. Um, thrilled and excited to be there, and the competition component of it was sort of on the side you know, a nice icing on the cake because kids do like to compete. I mean, that's a fun part of it too. And as an outside agency, just thinking about that partnership, I think one of the ways we see our role is to help to be thought partners with really skilled and talented teachers to bring resources there, but to help give them sort of time and energy and frameworks that let them build their own curriculum that works. Um, so we don't frame ourselves necessarily as curriculum developers, but as thought partners in that space. So a lot of what they've created has really been teachers running with it and then us finding opportunities to share it. There was another question, yeah. So thinking very tactically from, uh, um, it sounds like the school board and the superintendent was very much behind this, but, but from, um, you three teachers, how did you actually come together? Was, were you selected? Did you self-select? I mean, so think, um, you know, in other school districts, um, I'm, you know, I'm thinking about Palo Alto School District, how might you suggest to them that they can start to implement something like this? Well, we go back a little ways. We have some history, so we just kind of talk and we're kind of, we're like-minded and we share ideas and we get excited and it's about a what if this and what if that and what if that. 
And then if we happen to bump into Brandilyn in the hall, she's really that way. <laughs> and you get the three of us together and we're a dangerous mix. So it's kind of a, it's, it was very organic. I don't know, I don't know if it, how it would have worked if it had been very deliberate. Well, I think w there's there are several things that we have in place as a district. One of the things that we do have is we have the strategic, we have the strategic plan that is really clear and really specific and really targeted to global education, and that is a district-wide um, belief system and value. And then on top of it, we were able to get some funding for strategic grants that teachers could apply for, and those grants were. Teachers could apply for any kind of a grant that might support the strategic plan. And then you get like-minded teachers together who sit down and think about what can we do to get some of that cash, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, and so, because it, you wanna do things in your classroom. And so that's kind of, you know, where the, the support system was in place for us to do that um, and to work together to collaborate. And one thing I just wanted to add, the, the work that we do, we do we work with districts across the country, and two of the larger urban districts are Minneapolis um, and uh, St. Paul and Oakland Unified as well. And when they started the process, um, one of the districts decided to be relatively top down. You know, it was sort of required for every ninth grade teacher to step into this. And it took three months to basically um, not be the enemy in that partnership um, because teachers weren't tapped in enough from the beginning. In the other places, the district had high level buy-in, but then allowed um, teachers to self-select to join an inaugural cohort and created time and space for that inaugural cohort to begin to see what kind of results would develop if they had this opportunity um, with some of these support systems. So that mix worked really well to get the kind of energy that seems organic here um, to be sort of systemically applied in a, in a large urban district. Um, because you know any teacher will tell you when it's jammed down your throat, it, it doesn't, doesn't really work. So I, I just wanted to mention too that our foundation gave $25,000 to the school district and said do w what you want to do. And so we turned those into teacher grants and I believe that the World Savvy was like an $8,000 grant um, that was funded. And also it's been the community as well. So the Rotary Club, after Rod made a presentation to the Rotary Club, they got so excited that they raised the money for the air travel to Ecuador. Um, and uh, so it's just, it, it, I think it's just planting seeds and letting them spread and supporting growth and, and and I think for a district that might not have those um, financial resources a couple of things to keep in mind is that whenever you have a great idea um, don't keep it under a bushel let it shine but do it in a way that's not threatening so with the world savvy we started just having world savvy days in the library and the kids would put up projects and then we would invite classes to come and see what they were doing and over time that got other people interested in, how did your kids do these projects? What is this about? Um, and then that, that's what drew some other teachers in to going to the World Savvy workshops and challenges. And now we have many teachers in our school doing different levels of projects around this same idea. And then the second thing is the parent community. Uh, kids go home and talk about what they're learning in school with the parents and the parents get really excited about that and then the parents want to hear more about it and see more about it and um, that then helps build momentum around these projects too. So those might be two things that are not financially based. I think we might be at time, is that right? So you have time to mingle or past time, but I just wanna give a huge round of applause to everyone on the stage. This is a phenomenal group of educators and leaders and really appreciate it. Um, thank you very much. Yes, so thanks, Dan Ed. While you're in clapping mode, thanks to Ed Moto, thanks to these terrific sponsors, thanks to everybody, thanks to Lucy for the vision thank of this you. event. Thank you. This is one thing we're doing. Uh, tomorrow is the Global Education, is Global Leadership Day which is the conference. We were saying it was a four hour event, but Fernando Reimers from Harvard has to present early. So it's still only four hours total, but it starts tomorrow morning at 10.30, his presentation half an hour, and then it skips forward to Gavin Dykes at 12.30. So don't miss the early one. Um, and then throughout the week, organizations have been putting their own events into the calendar. I think we have 20, 30, 30 events now. So do look. 
I spent hours and hours building the multiple time zone pages the other day. So you can go in and actually look at the events in different time zones. We know all of you are going to be using the same page, but um, it is fun. And please do promote this. So let people know this is taking place. Anything else? Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Thanks to everybody for the day. I hope you have fun mingling.